got some intro. Yep, that looks good. Well, Bob, if you want to get us started. I can do that. Um, so uh, welcome to uh, uh, all, all of the folks that are here. Uh, welcome to uh, the Citizen Advisory Council meeting, uh, which is also a public meeting on our biennial season setting uh, for, this, uh, for this year. We've got a number of folks that are still joining us and as they trickle in, um, we'll, uh, we'll uh, add them to the, to the mix. Um, just a reminder, um, uh, a Zoom courtesy, switch your microphone off when you're not talking. Uh, uh, many of you will also already have your uh, microphone muted. Um, and uh, if you want to talk or if you have a question or whatever, uh, please hold your hand up by uh, either clicking on the little raise hand icon at the bottom of your screen, uh, or if you don't have one of those, just uh, turn your camera on and, and raise your hand and, uh, and Robbie will unmute you so that we can talk uh, when it's appropriate. Um, the other thing you can do is there's a question and answer Q&A uh, icon at the bottom of your frame there. You can type your uh, questions in there. Uh, and those will be either answered by the, the biologists and the folks that are here, um, or they'll be elevated to uh, questions that can be asked of, of the whole group. So uh, don't hesitate to do that. Um, so this, this meeting tonight is uh, about biennial hunting season setting uh, rules. And so uh, that's what we're going to talk about. That's, we're going to have... Uh, uh, questions and information about that. And we're not going to talk about uh, legislative initiatives or other uh, uh, commission initiatives that don't have to do with legislative or don't have to do a season setting unless we get to the end of the evening and we've got some time that we can talk about almost anything that you want. Um, so uh, to get started tonight, I'm going to introduce some of the uh, FWP folks uh, that are here. Uh, and then uh, we're going to uh, 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 let some of the uh, Citizen Advisory Council folks introduce yourself and uh, briefly tell us uh, where you're from, uh, what your area of interest is. Um, and uh, then we're going to turn it over to, uh, uh, over to Mike Ruggles, uh, the regional supervisor. Uh, and he's going to get us started with a presentation on our biennial season setting. Um, and uh, he's, he's gonna pause after each uh, major topic area uh, so that we uh, don't have to save our questions to the end of the evening. Uh, and we'll uh, ask any of you that uh, uh, the CAC members that have questions uh, or, uh, or thoughts, uh, and then we'll also hear from those members of the, uh, of the public or, who are here uh, as part of this meeting. Um, so, um, By the end of the evening, then also Mike will uh, will have a bunch of information on how best to comment uh, on these things that uh, on the biennial season setting stuff, uh, so that your information gets to the right ears and the right eyes uh, to uh, to get considered uh, when the commission uh, takes this back up in February. Uh, so for right now, I'm going to uh, uh, introduce some of the folks that are here from Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Um, the uh, uh, Mike Ruggles, of course, is the uh, regional supervisor. He is here. Uh, we've got some uh, some biologists who are here that have put this uh, most of this stuff together. Uh, Ashley Taylor uh, is will be with this evening, and uh, she'll be glad to uh, answer questions. Um, uh, Justin Paw, uh, our biologist from uh, Big Timber, is on this evening. Um, Matt Ladd is the regional uh, wildlife uh, manager here. Uh, and Matt will uh, help out a lot this evening. Uh, Sean Stewart is joining us from uh, Red Lodge, uh, and he will uh, uh, he'll be able to answer questions uh, from that area and from a great number of things uh, that he deals with. Uh, we also have an additional uh, wildlife uh, biologist, Megan O'Reilly, who I don't see on yet this evening, uh, but she is also helpful in putting this together. Um, so, uh, uh, the other, the other person that uh, uh, comes from, from the department 
that I'd like to introduce this evening uh, is Brian Siebel, the commissioner from Region 5. Uh, and uh, Commissioner Siebel, would you like to say some things before we get started? Yes, thank you, Bob. I appreciate that. And uh, first of all, thank you, everyone, for, for allowing me to be here tonight and participate in this process, especially thank you to, to, to Mike and the, and the Region 5 CAC. I just wanted to say a couple things, just a couple minutes worth uh, how we got here tonight. And um, you know, we started out early December. We got a, a proposal from the director's office in, 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 in Helena uh, that you know that had some pretty pretty uh, what would some people call it some pretty crazy and revolutionary ideas. And, and uh, I will say for everyone on this call, and I think everyone knows this, the commission, uh, the commissioners, we all got the information at the same time the public did. And um, uh, I do want to say that I really appreciate the number of calls, the phone calls, the emails that we got from that point in time when that first proposal went out until we had our working meeting on December 13th and then had our commission meeting on the 14th. So just an incredible amount of, of outpouring of, of phone calls and emails and just, just public, public input into the process, which I really appreciate. We, uh, we, we went to that working meeting on December 13th with that, with that original proposal in hand. And, uh, you know, between the, the, the personal opinions, the, you know, really the feelings of the commissioners that were there and all the public input, you know, we, we tasked the director with, with going back to the drawing board and, and coming up with something different that, that was not that original proposal. And so uh, the, the director and, and Dustin, the assistant director, you know, spent and, and several people in the department of spent a lot of hours at night rewriting a lot of things to, to come up with proposals that we could discuss in our working meeting, our actual commission meeting on the 14th. So. That's how we got here today. We, we, we made some more changes on the 14th. And I think, you know, came up with some, some good ideas with, with the whole concept of what we're trying to do with a new administration, you know, new director in, in the department, really a new commission, six out of seven people, new commission. And, you know, we really want to, we really want to try to move the new needle uh, as far as changing things and improving things for all the stakeholders involved. So. I want to say that this process tonight, this 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 process of the department and the in, in informational process that the, the department's undertaking tonight is, is really, really critical. And I appreciate everyone, especially the CAC members and the public that are that are also participating in this, because information is really, really important. And tonight is all about information. And as as Bob said, Mike's going to explain how to to put in comments so that they get to all the commissioners, not just to me or not just to individual commissioners or individual people in the department. So that everyone can see them. I do want to let everyone know that I do read all the emails. I, I listen to all my phone messages and I apologize, especially to people in Region 5, since I do represent uh, Region 5 in the state. I apologize if I don't get back to you on the phone calls, uh, on messages or on emails, but I will tell you that I do read them and I've been reading the comments already being posted on this on the season setting as well. So public comments and, and the public input is really, really important part of this process. And so I encourage everyone, everyone that's on this call. And, and there's subsequent meetings, obviously, to, to participate in that process. I also want to warn people that uh, there, there's a lot of sentiment out there that this is a, a pure democratic process. And the more the more input we get on one side or the other, it's going to, you know, that's the way it's going to go. If we get 10 times as many comments on one, one topic, that's the, what the commission is going to decide. But I can assure you that, you know, while this is a fair process, this is not a pure democratic process in the sense that we definitely take public opinion into, into account. We have so many other things that we have to take into account, like legislative you know, legislative initiatives. We have to take into account management plans. We have to take into account social impacts, the science from the department, all of these things we try to put together. So just understand that this is not just a democratic process where if a group decides to mass email, uh, that's not necessarily going to sway the commission. So, uh, it, but again, I really, really appreciate the fact that people are, are here and listening tonight to the informational session and appreciate the fact that the department put it on. And I'll end really quickly here. I've got, a, got an email just from the Elf Foundation tonight, uh, telling all its members that the gen, you know the, the deadline for comments is uh, extended to January 21st. In the end of that email, you know the the, the foundation Elf Foundation, which I have to be a member of, says you know be engaged, learn more, and make your voices known. And I think the the best part about that is be engaged and learn more, and that's really the critical thing because there's so many moving parts to this process. So. Thank you very much for allowing me to participate tonight. And I really look forward to the questions and, and the answers from the from the department. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Siebel. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, I've got a number of CAC members here this evening, uh, but I'm going to ask just to uh, briefly uh, talk to us about where they're from and uh, what their uh, 
what their area of interest is. Uh, to start with, uh, the, the chairman of the CAC uh, is uh, Doug Driesen. Uh, so Doug, would you uh, introduce yourself? Go ahead, Doug. Doug need to be unmuted. We're gonna to have to circle back around to Doug, it looks like. Um, uh, Bruce Hoyland. Uh, Bruce, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, Bruce Hoyland, CAC member out of Roundup. Uh, I love to hunt, fish, and camp, and have been involved in that all my life. And I try and represent the sportsmen and the landowners in our area. Thank you. Um, Susan Gilberts is here. Sorry, yeah, I am here. Um, I live in Billings. I teach at MSU Billings. I teach geography and environmental studies, and I've been um, studying issues in the Yellowstone River Valley for about 17 years. Okay. Uh, Kahan Ostabar. Uh, hi there, Bob. I, I think I, I just got joined as a panelist, so can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Kahan Ostabar. Um, uh, I'm a professor at Rocky Mountain College, and I've served on this committee for a few years now. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lee Deming. There you go. Yeah, you hear me? Uh huh. Yeah, I'm Lee. Oh, I think we lost him there. Got re muted. So, uh, uh, is go ahead, Lee. Sorry, that's all right. Nobody did that on purpose, right? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah, so uh, retired educator. Uh, I like to hunt elk and fish the bighorn and other rivers around here. And uh, I like to represent, as somebody said earlier, both uh, landowners and sportsmen. Very good, thank you, uh, Rusty Butler. Can we unmute Rusty? So a trick that uh, somebody just told me about this too is if you push your space bar, it'll unmute while you're holding your space bar. Yeah, can you so hear me? That's a, that's a trick. Yeah, go ahead, Rusty. Yeah. yeah, sorry, it's been a few months since I've been on Zoom. Uh, I'm Rusty Butler. I'm just an avid outdoorsman. I've been hunting in Montana for a long time. Um, I, I just feel like I represent the interest of my, my friends and people have a similar interest as me. Very good, thank you. Uh, have uh, have we been able to get Doug Dreesen uh, unmuted? And he just signed back in, so I think he should. Uh, be. Okay. Okay. Do you do we have you there, Doug? Last unmute. We'll come back to him again then. Um, and Steve Regal is here. Oh, uh, Doug's on. My name is Steve Regal. I'm an ecologist. I'm president of the Yellowstone Valley Audubon Society. Um, I hunt and fish and camp in uh, Montana. I uh, have for many decades. I uh, represent uh, a lot of the non-game enthusiasts as well as uh, hunters and fishermen. Very good. Thanks, Steve. Um, Doug's on. What, Doug? Doug's ready. Go, Doug. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Sorry about that, gentlemen. Thanks again for doing this. Yeah, my name is Doug Greeson, and I live down in the Ballantyne area, and I've been involved in hunting and fishing throughout 
Montana, basically here in region five. And I have hunted quite a bit in region seven. And my main interest is, uh, like I said, big game and access and, and uh, trying to help out as, with the CAC as much as I can. And hopefully uh, uh, the people I've talked to, I can relate that to you for some comments this evening. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. If we've got any other CAC members that we haven't <coughs> grabbed from the attendees, if you raise your hands, we'll probably we'll be able to let you in and visit. So, and if you're on a phone, what is it, star six to be able to unmute, Robbie? Yes. Okay. Okay, and it looks yeah. like I have one person coming in on a telephone. So, okay. Um, Thank you, uh, CAC members, and uh, we're going to get into the heart of our program now, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, uh, Mike Ruggles, uh, the Region 5 uh, Supervisor, uh, to get us started on biennial season setting. All right, well, thanks uh, for all the introductions and for everybody joining. Um, tonight is one of those nights where, uh, you know, Doug, we had offered up to the CAC members that if they were uncomfortable with Zoom to come on in, and uh, Doug was one of them that said, I'd almost rather just be in there and Doug changed his mind for some reason today maybe he had to do something with the snow the cold and the slick road so as uh, challenging as zoom may be this is one of those times I think where, where zoom is appropriate and uh, can work good and we can reach a lot of folks and we've done two of these already and had a pretty good turnout tonight it's kind of light and we have some other regional staff and staff from outside the region listening in as well um, so we may have some time to actually do a little bit of round table here at the end, which I didn't necessarily anticipate, but we'll see how things go tonight. So, so the way that we'll run through, as Bob said, I've got a presentation. Uh, it's modified from the, the last couple and uh, we'll stop as we hit some of the topics to go through, but just to start laying out uh, some of the things that are up for consideration. So I'm gonna shut off my uh, camera so you guys don't have to look at me trying to read slides and then uh, get on over to it. So, so here we go. So we introduced the uh, wildlife biologists and they really have been the uh, bedrock of getting these proposals and the, the biology pulled together. Um, they started this back in September uh, when the request came out and said, hey, we really wanna look at you know, consolidating what we can, getting rid of license types to reduce the number of choices but still either expand or maintain opportunity and just make it a bit easier for folks, you know, get rid of clutter where we don't need it, um, combine districts where we can, get rid of things that just have caused a lot of phone calls and concerns and questions if they're not biologically needed. And so really get down, get down to the basics of the biology and then we'll work back up through uh, with the commissioners. Uh, obviously we've had some stuff that's legislative that we're working through to get things lined up, but just to give you an idea of what they cover, you know, they all have pretty large areas. Ashley Taylor is our into the north and uh, pulls up the snowies and the little belts. Justin Pa off to our west with the crazies. Megan O'Reilly, a little bit of the bulls and down here out of the Billings area. And then Sean Stewart, our biologist out of Red Lodge for the bear tooths. And, you know, in addition to that, uh, having their own particular areas, they also have special specialties, and you can see those listed on the right-hand side of the slide. Um, so we might be might wonder why we turn over a question to a particular biologist. It'll be related to what area they're from, and then also uh, what species that they have their specialties in and that they've worked on. So, so thanks to all of those folks for really um, doing a lot of work uh, on this. Matt Ladd coming in, uh, we had him hired after we'd already had our first meeting. Um, and starting to do this. I'm very grateful to have a wildlife manager uh, pop up and start to take some of the weight off of this. Um, but without the biologist, Matt and I probably would have still been swimming and, and uh, probably looked a little bit different than we do. I certainly would have had more hair and less gray or so, um, or more gray. So, so anyway, really want to thank those. Also want to point out Robbie uh, is our one of our admin staff and he's helping run the meeting. So if uh, you raising your hand and doing that. He's assisting Bob with uh, keeping things running. And he's he's really the guy that's got his fingers on Zoom here too. So if we have some issues that come up, we'll work with him to get those resolved, so. 
So where we are and, and where have we come from? So I mentioned we started in September. Um, we went out with uh, some proposals that came from the biologist and did some scoping. And then we modified those proposals a little bit from some of the input that we got from the public. So we did actually make some changes. Um, so we were listening, looking to see what made sense, still manage the biology piece. Um, it went up to the director's office, uh, some modifications there, which is their legal rights to do that. So it's not like somebody's sneaking in and making changes. That's, that's part of their obligation as being a director. Um, and the one that really caught people's attention uh, in December, about a week before the commission meeting, the news release went out saying, you know, we're going to make it unlimited on private land and we're going to reduce licenses by 50% uh, for uh, either sex in these areas that are over objective. Um, that uh, was gained a lot of phone calls, a lot of frustration with folks. And uh, the commission the night before the meeting um, was working with staff and said, yeah, that one's not going to go. So, you know, as Brian had mentioned, Commissioner Siebel, you guys go back to the table, come up with something a little bit different for the morning. This is kind of what we're thinking, and we'll go from there. So then they had their meeting. The commissioners also added some proposals that came in there that are up for review. So we have a blend of all of these that are out there for, for comment. So that meeting ended on uh, December 14th, and then we started our public comment period. Uh, for us, on December 28th, we held an elk focus virtual meeting. Uh, we had 27 participants, uh, really robust discussion. On uh, the last 15, 20 minutes, uh, we went into some of the other species and had time for, for some of that discussion. Uh, for the deer, antelope, bear, lion, and all those others, we did that the following night on December 29th. Um, and I think we had about 10 folks uh, attend that one. So we know where the interest lies and we expect tonight where we're gonna have most of our discussion will be on elk. Um, but we had those two, which I, I kind of wonder, we have kind of a light attendee attendance tonight. I wonder if maybe we've hit that, plus we're the fourth combined CAC season setting meeting. And so some of these statewide proposals have really been hammered out in some of those. I've participated in two of those live and then I caught up with region one. Um, that three hours of theirs uh, kind of hit and miss on the video. So I'll show you where you can see those if you wanna go back in and listen. Um, and so tonight we'll do ours. Uh, there's a schedule for the remaining regions to finish up over the next week or so. Um, so this is to review what those tentative proposals are. Um, we also had uh, some folks uh, from the Roundup area. We've heard a few from the Harlequin area, um, some in the Billings area, Laurel area saying, you know, we'd really like to have a, an in-person public meeting. And uh, we, we do like those public meetings. We do like those in-person ones. And so we are gonna offer that up. And so January 13th, we're gonna have a public meeting. However, uh, if the nights, you know, well, the night could be like this, most of our biologists, if not all of them, will be participating by Zoom on the screen in our, our meeting room while we have people there and I'll be in there and we'll negotiate between the questions and, and having those specialists there to answer those questions. So rather than have all of our staff drive their, you know, 80 to 100 miles and make the loop and then get back at midnight or end up staying, um, we're going to do that. But definitely offering that opportunity, 6.30 to 9 next week on Thursday the 13th, and uh, we'll, we'll do essentially the same presentation that we have. So, so another opportunity to wrap up that we hadn't uh, had in there to start with. So here's a slide that uh, begins to speak to uh, what we're doing. Um, so this is information and comment, but we're not collecting comment here. We're definitely listening and we'll go out in the hallway and we'll talk about ideas that were presented to us tonight. You know, Commissioner Siebel will have those in his head. Um, it's unlikely that the commissioners are gonna take the time to go to seven CAC meetings and listen to three hours of, of discussion to look for little gems in there. So while you can comment here, it's not gonna be recorded. It's being recorded video, but the real way to comment is to go online and comment there, or you can do it by email or mail. And I'm gonna show you how that's done, but you know, get to our website. Uh, many of you uh, from the public side, that's where you found our link. And then I'll go about throw that. If you have a uh, photographic memory, you can memorize that link and that'll get you there. Um, but I'll show you how to get there a little bit easier. So there is a way to comment online, and this is the, the highly recommended and most efficient way. It's a survey monkey, so it starts to organize the data. It also allows you to put in your text and do it that way. 
but it makes it much easier for us and the and the commissioners are able to look at that information coming in on a daily basis as it's updated and so that gets to all seven of them almost immediately um, emails you know somebody's got to put those together get them in a packet and that's happening but it's a little bit slower and it's not maybe as organized as the survey monkey piece and then the mail um, we hope that it gets there in time it has to go through the sorting office and get somebody to open it make copies do all that stuff so much slower and less preferred but we're not going to turn anybody away that uh, wants to do it that way or email uh, or send in letters by groups or any of that so um, but getting online is the best way to do it and tonight is not the place don't don't come here and think you know i did it i went i spoke my piece and i'm good and i've, I've made my mark nope that happens by getting those comments in in writing so tonight is about asking questions to help you formulate um, what you might want to put in. I'm going to go through just quickly uh, a little bit of our website to help folks uh, orientate themselves um, to what we've got. So this is where you'd pop up to our web page. Nice picture, of Adam Strainer, biologist up in Canyon Ferry with a nice fish there. Drop on down and there's a tile. So you'd click on that proposed hunting regulation changes. So it'll tell you how long the, the comment period, it's been extended by one week, which allowed us to bump that 13th meeting in and not be so crowded. You can click on that to go to the email. If you wanna see those other meetings, tomorrow ours will be uh, put up online. For instance, I mentioned that I went and listened to region one. You could go listen to the region one CAC uh, and join in with all that. Region seven is completed. Region six did theirs last night. Uh, oh, there's not up quite yet. Yeah, region seven is on there. Okay. So that's how to get to the meetings and also to the links for the future meetings. See the schedule. So when I start talking about uh, the statewide proposals, this is where that information came from. You can click onto the statewide proposal, for example. And uh, you know, say, hey, I want to, I want to learn more about the hunting season dates. You could open up the information that's there. So this is where we build that calendar. Where are all the dates? Where do they all fit? What does that all look like for every every different species that's there? So if you want to just see the table of when's the seasons being proposed and what changes, for instance, pheasants are being proposed as being extended to January 31st rather than January 1st, and you would find that in this table. So after reviewing that, looking at that, bounce back and say, yeah, I want to provide my name or not. Type in your comment, click done, and that's going to be organized into that topic. If you wanted to go down and look at uh, the game damage, you know, what kind of quotas do we use when we're dealing with game damage hunt management seasons? CWD is an example of wildlife health. This is what gives us that ability. This is Kind of the housekeeping piece that people haven't heard much about but it's there the folks that are really interested in deer and elk they want to see statewide the map of where changes have been made we've talked a lot about combining districts and where that happened if you see the orange lines that is showing a new district boundary lines that are yellow there are no changes. So you can see region seven didn't really make any changes to their district. Region six made a few. We made a fair number coming right through the middle of our, our region. So it's okay to comment on those as well. If you don't think that splitting those districts uh, was helpful, or if you think we should add more, you know, feel free to propose that and, uh, and why that would be a good, good thing to do or not. If you wanted to look, and I'll start out with these uh, statewide proposals that have effect across multiple districts. We'll talk more about those, but this is where you would comment. And it's got everything lined up so you can go right through the survey monkey pieces, hit done on each one of those and get it in. And then if you want to see the region five specific information, you come here, you want to see the master list, for instance, uh, of what's happening with region five elk. This has got the language of what the changes are. Maybe more important, people are wondering, why did you do it? You can download this and the biologists have put together this document that says, 
These were the pros and cons. This is what we were weighing. On our first meeting, we had some questions about the biology. Where is this elk plan that you guys keep talking about? How do we know which districts are over objective? Where do we find that stuff? You jump over here to the conservation tab, move down to the bottom, say you wanted to see elk or deer or any of these other species, you'd be able to look at the information that we have. This would get you into the distributions, the charts and maps, and we could start to look at where those are at. So elk objectives, people wonder what we're talking about when we say we're over objective, particularly the 200% and greater. There it is, the bright red. And so th that's how those districts were picked out. So 100 to 200%. So just under the 200. So that's where that information came from. We also had some discussions about CWD and some of the other regions had uh, discussions about CWD. Um, so I got caught up on that today as well. You click on conservation, CWD in Montana. And uh, one of the things that the governor's asked is what kind of information can we get out there that uses this dashboard tool uh, that many of you have seen with COVID and where we're at. So this is the total number of samples since uh, 2017 that are positive. You can zoom into the districts. For instance, we wanna look at 500. And there hasn't been any uh, positives in deer or elk. 303 samples across the board, 270 of those mule deer. So if you want to find information on that related to uh, why are we doing and managing, you know, one of the questions that came to us was, you know, it doesn't seem like you guys are doing much for CWD. Well, we're a couple years ahead of some of the other areas that had, you know, new, new findings of CWD. And uh, we had some special hunts, if you recall, to try to increase our sample size and see what's going on. So with that, I'm going to back away from the website, but it's easy to pull that up if we need information as we're having discussions. I also wanna share that uh, when we did our elk and deer specific, I went through district by district and we're not gonna do that tonight. That would take the entire night of me talking and I don't wanna take the entire night. I want really to get over to you folks with this stuff. So, so with that, we're gonna start and we're gonna go through at this point, slide by slide. This Turn my camera back on in case we're uh, sharing sharing conversation here. But um, so statewide, does anybody have questions about the season dates, which is the first table that I opened up? The license quota ranges are assigned by the commission. We get approval. So within that quota that gets put out in the booklet, we have a range that we can play with. We have to stay in the range that's going to be approved coming up at the next uh, commission meeting. So that's all there. Um, game damage, the management season, wildlife health, all that. I'm guessing this is more of a housekeeping one and there's not much for conversation, but if there is, please raise your hand or unmute your mics and uh, we can take those if there are any questions. Okay, I'm not gonna dally very long on those and we can always back up if somebody comes something up to mind. Um, so this is one that uh, has created a, a fair amount of discussion. Uh, the elk archery only permit proposal, which is uh, across the state. So unbundle and remove the 920 archery only either sex permit in all of those districts. And for us, we'd be hitting 500, 502, 510, 511, 520, 530, 570, 75, 80, and 90. Um, and we're either going to general license or unlimited. I have a graphic that will show what this looks like on the landscape, um, but this is the one that's there uh, for all those districts. We can't necessarily speak for those other regions, but we can talk about uh, you know, why this was being done and where we were at, but we did unbundle and then made some changes in response to that. Any, any questions on, on this one? And for those in the attendees, just raise your hand and Robbie or Bob will get you pulled in too, so. All right. The either sex elk permit pro proposal. Um, so in the hunting districts, 411, that list, I won't read through them, but specifically for us, it'll be 411 and 535 and 590. Uh, we ended up uh, increasing by 50% the number of permits that will be available for those either sex elk. So that this is the one that uh, started out with uh, 
drop 50%, split it between private and public. This is what ended up being the direct one. Uh, we did have an error in our master list in our table that was still reflecting the original proposal. So I'll have a slide that addresses that too. But any questions on this one? Okay, you guys are gonna make this easy tonight. Elk antlerless bee license proposal. So the commission is proposing to add a new statewide unlimited antlerless bee license valid on private land in those elk hunting districts that were the bright red, those are over 200% objectives. Um, and it'd be over the counter and it'd be valid February 15th uh, through February 15th, starting in the early season as well. And so in our district, that'd be the 411, 535, 515, 575, 580, and 590. And I do have a slide that specifically kind of demonstrates what that looks like in uh, Region 5. Any questions there? Okay. So this is one that's also had a few folks talking, and it's kind of an east-west kind of discussion from what I've kind of picked up from uh, some of the other CAC meetings and things that I've heard in the past as well. But, you know, there's often, uh, you know, the, the complaint being, People show up or draw a permit that's coveted in the breaks in particular, um, and they decide that they don't go for whatever reason, and then they harvest an animal, you know, back out west someplace. Um, so it would limit you if you were to draw a bull permit um, for whatever season that that was valid in, if it was archery or rifle, that is the only district that you could do that. Outside of that season with that weapon, you could go back to another district in the general area in the general season and use that, but not within the one that you applied for and received. So this is, you know, pick your place. So any comments or anything that anybody's got for that one? Okay. So now we're gonna start sliding into the region five, move past kind of the statewide piece, and we're gonna start focusing on what does it look on a region five? Um, the biologists are here to answer questions. Matt's here to answer questions as well. Um, and then at the end, if we want to talk about other things, I think we're going to have plenty of time to do that tonight too. So, but uh, so we're asked to uh, simplify, combine where we can, um, explain kind of what's happening on the landscape. And when we met, we went through and, you know, basically I said, let's start out that we have one, one district, region five. Well, that wasn't very tenable and that was a quick one to jump past. The biologist did pause on, we have three districts based on habitat types across the entire region. After a couple of days of thinking about it, it was like, you know, that's probably doesn't give us enough tools to manage when we think about CWD on the landscape, what areas are over objective and not over objective and how we blend and meld those. And, and so we ended up uh, pulling back together and this is when Matt came in as well and uh, started helping take the reins on this too. Um, but they came up with, uh, we had five districts we ended up with 10. So I've already showed you, shown you that we've combined some. Some of them remain the same. And then we picked up one, it's 565 over in the Southwest corner. It's a new one, but it actually is an old one from the 1980s and earlier um, that was out there. So this one's kind of been revisited. We were supposed to take a slant on elk and deer being the priority and then try to fit as many species into this distribution or this, these units as we could. Um, when we start looking at license types, if you were to open up your booklet, you know, and you go to your district and it's got your lines general, you know, here's your cow tags, here's your deer tags, those are the license and permit types. So if you counted those up, um, we had 62 LPTs for elk and 37 for LPTs for deer in this last book. Um, the proposal that we have now takes us down to 32 LPTs for elk and 29 for deer. So I went through all of those LPTs during the elk one, just for elk and then the deer. So if we wanna to go to a specific district, you let me know and I'll go find that slide further down in the presentation that's I don't plan on talking tonight. Um, I'm guessing that if folks have questions about their specific district, they already kind of know where they're at and then we can reference that. The other thing that we had was a fair number of portions, which are on this map and the hash marks. And we were asked, do you really need those portions? Because they do create a lot of confusion. It is a challenge for enforcement at times 
to be talking to folks about, you know, well, you're actually in this district, but you're in a portion. So that's a different LPT line or a different explanation in the book. Um, so can you get rid of those? So we did get rid of ours. We ended up after the scoping, keeping the 701 attachment to 590 here. So that's as much about region seven as it is five. But that's what we were dealing with once we got rid of those. You know, there's our districts and what's it gonna work? And then we had our discussion one, three or 10, ends up being 10 and that's the map that we're working with now. So you can see in the background what the old numbers were, what the new numbers are. Um, so 535 is the one that's been gaining a lot of attention um, with some of the last work that's been going on. So here's the uh, that statewide 920 either sex elk archery permit in region five, also was valid in several other districts, but that's the one that we went to get rid of. So what did we do in its place? Well, we're using the elk management plan. We're looking at biology. We're looking at where we're at objective or under objective. Uh, and what those documents share with us. Commissioner Siebel said, you know, we're playing the dance between what's coming out of the legislature, what's in plans, what can we do, where are we at, what the biologists can recommend. So we came up, uh, we could actually go to general elk licenses in these districts off to the west. Over here, we started out by having two different districts with different quotas, but we were splitting the mussel shell, which essentially splits the bulls from the snowies but it also splits a lot of ranches that have land on both sides following the Muscle Shell River. That wasn't very popular. We got a fair number of comments on that. And so we ended up, well, there's no reason why we can't just combine it, make 595.21. So this permit would be used with the general license and they could only hunt in that district um, and go from there. And that would include that portion of 701. Any thoughts or comments on that? Questions? The next one is the elk B license. Uh, and this is the 900 that's being proposed unlimited over the counter for those districts that are over 200% objective for private lands only. So how do we get to those animals that are on those private lands that are in these large herds um, that are causing us to be over objective? So this is one of the proposals that it allows this opportunity to pick up a second license. So at this time you'd be able to harvest three elk if you went through all the license types that were available for folks in region five. And this is one of the ways to do that. I do wanna bring up, you know, what changes might occur and, and is this the final, you know, is this the last word? Um, so we did not propose that 540 be included in this 900 license. Visiting with Matt and Ashley, Matt coming in to visit with me, you know, early surveys are showing that 540 was so close to being over objective it's likely gonna be over objective because of the limited amount of harvest that occurred this year, um, production that was there. And so we are questioning whether or not that should have just been included in the proposal. This being a statewide one, it didn't come from the region necessarily, but as a region now we're looking at it going, maybe that should be there. So if you're thinking about writing comments, even though that's not in the master list or in the table, that's one we'd be happy to hear about. And uh, we're certainly gonna have that conversation with the Wildlife Division, the Director's Office, and the Commissioners as well. So Commissioner Siebel and I were visiting a little bit about that one earlier today. Um, but this would be the, the districts that that 900 license is valid in for those districts over 200%. Any questions, comments on that? Elk B license. So there was an elk bee license that had 3,500 tags available um, and it was 595.00. And it was, you could use it in these districts here. And it was uh, on all the lands, excluded some of the forest service lands, which is why this is roughly drawn around some of the forest service. So what are we proposing uh, as an alternative? Well, if we could combine licenses, we were asked to combine licenses, get rid of uh, permits for cows, uh, if we could. And so here's an elk bee license that uh, ends up taking those 3,500, adding to the 00500, um, adding to the 2,500 that were available there, turning that into 6,000, which will be able to use on private, public, and forest service lands uh, under this proposal. Any questions on that one? 
Hey, here's where we have uh, some combined licenses with uh, the 411 district, the Snowies. So this would be uh, the Snowies area. This is the one that went up uh, by 50%. So there'll be 450 permits available under the proposal. And hunters may not hunt another district if they draw this permit, as an example, is one of those. Um, and uh, this is an increase, again, by that 50% for these three districts that are over objective. Questions on that one? There's also the antlerless elk option. So this is not one of those places where you could get that third tag and go out and get your second cow. Um, 1,200 licenses available. Uh, we have the early and late seasons. So the August and the February, January, February seasons that would only be valid on private land. Um, archery rifle and muzzle loader on public and private lands during those regular general seasons. So that would be an another way to be able to get in there and try to get some more of those animals off the landscape to get closer to objective. Any questions? Okay. So I have slides for every one of the districts that are like this. I only have a few of these that I'm bringing up because there was something that was on them that was uh, not right or they were important to bring up. So this is the example of the license permit types. So one, two, three, four, five, six. This is very different from those that are down out of the Beartooth in the Red Lodge area where there's two or three options there. Um, and there's just a lot of things happening on the landscape. If you were to pull this table off of the website that I showed you, it's going to say 150. That's a 50% reduction from the quota that was there last year. And that's not what actually went forward from the commission, just didn't get updated. Um, I think that's gonna get replaced here soon. I know the table got done. I just don't know if it's been uh, added into the list and, and updated. The other one that uh, happens throughout, so legislatively, the uh, muzzle loader season came in and it's supposed to follow after the general season. Um, we have a lot of places in the table or we weren't focused on getting that in there. It's going to be in there as long as the general season ended on November 27th. It's going to show up in here for any of those seasons. Now, if it's just an early season antlerless elk period, it's not going to necessarily show up there. But here it shows up, you know, or not there. So a late season date, it also wouldn't show up. It does follow the general season, last day of general season, then that muzzle loader comes in. So if you're looking at that table and going, why? Don't the muzzle loader things line up where I think they should? That is an omission, and we didn't go through and get that squared up. But that will be squared up before they go out, uh, and that is a legislative, a legislative deal. So, I'm going to jump into whitetail deer. So this is one where we had three different licenses for you to be able to go out and shoot an antlerless whitetail deer. So looking at the does or, or a juvenile bucks. 597, 598, 599 00. There were 4,900 licenses available in that license type. We're proposing to go to a district wide, wherever they're at, 00500, and we increased it by a few hundred licenses to 5,200 licenses available under this proposal. Any questions on, on that? Hunting District 540, this is one where uh, one of the uh, asks was if, if you have less than 50 licenses, you need to ask yourself, biologists, is it worth having that season or should you just get rid of it because it's such a limited opportunity? This had been at 10. So in the scoping period, we proposed to go to 50 to hit that minimum threshold. We got feedback pretty quickly that, you know, hey, we don't think that the, the mule deer in 540, so this is up in the little belts, we don't think they're doing that well. We're, you know, we don't have game damage problems. We really wish you kind of back off of those does a little bit. Um, you know, could you bring that down and get rid of it? So we we got rid of it. Um, we were only at ten, so that one's out. Um, but it shows up in the table again. That was an omission from the scoping period that didn't get updated. So we've had a couple of comments on that. I thought that was gone. It is indeed gone, um, and we'll move from there. So, so that. And then this one showed the no boundary changes. So just those couple license types up there as an example. Any questions for that one? Okay. So antelope, uh, this is one, uh, you know, Doug has brought this up at a couple of the other meetings. It's like, are you sure you folks wanna 
change the numbers for all of these because it's going to make the shop Pam and Robbie shop uh, have to answer a lot of questions about I, I want to go back to where I hunted last year, but I can't find it. We're going to live through a couple years of this if it goes through we'll certainly be answering those questions, but we would have issues with uh, an antelope tag that was a 900 tag and then people would be out with a 900 tag thinking it was deer instead of antelope and vice versa and just created confusion. So the antelope licenses all are gonna end with a six and whatever the dash. We also combine some districts. We have a couple that have no changes and then changes in these districts here. So most of you know that I have that fisheries background. I do like to hunt, but I haven't been chasing antelope for a while. So uh, Justin has uh, worked with me to make sure that I say there's no changes from last year's district quotas, but I kept looking at last year's booklet going, but there's not matching up. Well, they do their surveys after the quota book comes out and then they make the adjustment afterwards. So the numbers you'll see in this year's are from last year's work. They're gonna match up. So there's no changes in the district quotas, but the districts that were combined, they just added those together. So the only thing that really happened in region five in Antelope was changing of the district names and combination of some of those districts. Anybody got questions or thoughts about the district changes or any of that? Okay. We're gonna have plenty of time here, folks. So season extensions. So this would be a statewide one for the upland bird. Uh, so the commission is proposing to extend upland bird game seasons for grouse, pheasant, partridge, and sharptail to January 31st. The current ending date is January 1st. So this would add on an extra month uh, out there. I've heard a few folks talking about this one at some of the other meetings. So if anybody's got questions on what's happening here, any of that, we can turn it over to the crew. Okay. Turkeys. So. Bigger change here is the spring turkey season date had started on April 10th to May 16th here in Region 5. Um, everything's going to be adjusted to April 15th to May 31st, so to move that down just a little bit. Um, and then there's an addition of using an air rifle as a legal means of taking turkeys. Matt came in and explained why legal means is important. Air rifles are not considered weapons um, or firearms, well, firearms. So yeah, catch me mad if I get it wrong. So they're not considered firearms and a means of being able to harvest animals. So this takes care of that and then describes which caliber and what, what, uh, uh, what the pellets you know, need to be at for their uh, rate that they run out, what they need to be. So, so this one just kind of cleans that up and we don't have any region five specific changes proposed at this time. So that's all statewide. So. Yeah, the velocities. There, I got my word. So we got hey, a few questions here, Mike. Yep. Thanks. Yep. Let Go him ahead, on. Steve. Yep, you're good to go, Steve. Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, I didn't catch up quick enough. But the slide before um, on the uh, expansion of grouse season from January 1st to January 31st, um, I haven't had a chance to do a real thorough evaluation of that of everything. Is there a real good explanation, a good set of data and a rationale for that change to expand that time frame from January 1st to January 31st for all those grouse? So I'll kick that to Matt and Matt can kick it to somebody else if he wants, but uh, I'll start with him. Yeah, Ashley, I think you'd probably be the best to maybe tackle that one a little bit. I don't know that there's been a ton of discussion. That one came about pretty early or uh, pretty late on in the process here. But Ashley, if you have some comments on that, go ahead. Yeah, I think this is one that came from a private um, individual to the commission. I, and it was out for public comment. Um, man, Sean, do you have any idea you know, I don't know biologically that this is gonna, you know, be too detrimental to the populations going from January 1st to January 31st, but um, Sean is pretty experienced with upland birds. Do you have any input there? Well, um, pretty much 
and as a, as a general rule, hunting hunting of, of, of grouse and pheasants and partridge, um, that's not a limiting factor on on grouse populations. Uh, what what makes it through the winter is basically based on on habitat carrying capacity. Um, so extending the season to January thirty first, uh, it's been discussed many times in the past. Um, biologically. It's uh, an insignificant impact on on the on the bird populations. Um, the pushback has frequently been um, uh, so much of this occurs on private land that the, the the ranching community typically has pushed back and said, you know, we really don't need another month of of, of hunting season. So. Um, like I say, it's it's been explored in the past, and uh, typically it hasn't gone forward. Uh, but it hasn't. It it's not because of a detriment to the to the bird populations. Uh, so, Steve, uh, Region Seven or Region Six, if you were to go back and when Six gets theirs posted, um, it's easy to kind of move through the slider bar on their on their video and look for this slide that comes up and talks about that upland bird. They, they had some pretty good discussions, um, some pros and cons, uh, some thoughts that uh, roosters uh, don't make life so easy for hens, particularly in winters that are bad or trying to share space that they are kind of hard on them. I don't know if that's accurate or not. That was one that came back up. Um, certainly heard from folks that, you know, it's another person banging on the door on New Year's Day after I thought I was done with hunting season. That's certainly been there. And then there's been landowners too that are like, you know, they're out there, it's an opportunity, it's kind of neat. So so kind of all over the board on that one. But uh, if you want to go back and listen I, and and hear what some other folks have said, you know, thought in places that have some pretty good uh, bird hunting, you know, I'd recommend going to listen to those too. And you'll hear the biologists talk a little bit about from their perspective in those other regions too. But Sean, Sean hit it pretty well pretty much what the other biologists have been saying too so yeah one on one other consideration that's kind of come up a little bit is you know some of that upland game bird habitat especially the cover uh, may be occupied by ungulates as well and um, during real harsh winters you know we all are familiar with the disturbance of uh, of ungulates deer um, for example that are living in the same habitat that the upland game birds are and if you know, bird hunters are tromping through that and really harsh winter conditions that doesn't do those deer many favors if they're getting up and they're running, you know, and, and moving around and expending energy and stuff. So that might be a consideration to look at as well. There were some concerns about consecutive drought years. Um, maybe I mean, it was a pretty good year for pheasants. Uh, the grasshoppers, not so great for ag, pretty good for birds. And, uh, so, but there was a little bit of, uh, you know, how does a harsh winter after drought um, look like? And so, but we also know that there's a really high mortality, natural mortality rate of, of a lot of these birds over the winter. And so that's where Sean's talking about that, you know, it's not, not necessarily additive to that. So it just pulls out from some of that natural mortality. So does that get you kind of what you needed, Steve? Yeah, it got, got me much more interested. Um, just to help cut the chase, uh, you said Region 7, and what was the other area that had some recorded conversation about that? Region 6. Okay. Yep. Yeah, yep. thank you for all that. I'll look into this a little more. Yep, and Region 7s is posted. Region 6, I thought, would be up today, but I bet you they have it tomorrow. So we're all learning how to get these things up so everybody can see them, too. So Robbie got his figured out today. So ours should be up pretty quickly with the help of our IT staff, Natalie. So Thank you all. Yeah. yeah. Cody had that same, basically that same question, Mike. And um, Cody, if you had more on that, um, definitely speak up or type in another question. Um, but I think we probably kind of covered what you were after there. Yeah. So Chris, I, we had seven to 10. I don't know if you got that one. Um, seven to 10 on the 29th, if that was the deer one, 28th, the elk one we were, I think peaked out at about 27 there. So Cody, did you get that one, Matt? So what's an LPT? That's that license permit type. So each line in the in the regs. And 
Did you uh, catch the sharp tail piece? Or is that kind of the same answer? That's what you were saying, Matt. Okay. Lee yeah. had his hand up earlier. Lee, did you still have a question? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Go ahead. Yeah. So I was uh, listening to that region six meeting last night. And uh, one of the other pieces that they had talked about is that they uh, spent some time looking at South Dakota's numbers. And uh, there was some concern, again, as somebody said about the uh, number of roosters and trying to take some of those roosters out. But uh, they claimed that South Dakota killed 100,000 pheasants in the month of July. Uh, and I think you'll see that on the, on the transcript or if you listen to that tape. Uh, so uh, the, there was virtually no discussion that I could hear on grouse. It was mostly pheasants. So that's all I, I have. Yep. Oh, thanks, Lee. Yeah, the one thing that they did say about grouse uh, out of the Region 6 is uh, their CSC members, as they were reporting out, it sounded like the grouse had a pretty good year up there as well. So, but nothing in relationship to the hunting piece. It was all kind of the round table. So, all right, we'll move on to the next one then. Covered the turkey, the air rifle, velocity requirements, state changes, nothing for us. Um, we did consider, just to give you guys a heads up, and it's not up for sending it in at this point. It would take a little bit more effort to kind of get things lined out, but we are going, a couple of the other regions matched up to the regional boundaries rather than county boundaries for this. And uh, we weren't quite there yet. Um, I wouldn't be surprised uh, in two years that uh, once we've had a chance to kind of work out where that's at, where the data lies is part of that too, um, that we're setting. So we may be coming with that. So if, if people are wondering why we didn't, um, we just quite, weren't quite ready. Part of that was manpower and time. And, and uh, so that might be something coming down the road, but mountain lions. Um, so the district changes, uh, we did change boundaries to match deer and elk districts. If I were to have pulled up each one of those districts, we have places that either lined up with the Muscleshell River for a district boundary or the Yellowstone River. And in some other districts out West, they were ridges. We were asked, can you move those to things that are a little easier to identify on the ground, which really means, is there a transportation route or road um, that's good? So for us, it made it pretty easy to snap to Highway 12 or I-90 uh, in districts all the way up and down the Yellowstone and then up and down the, the Mussel Shell. And we had it where some species, they were to the river and another species was already to the, the road boundaries. So we, we pulled all those together so they're the same. Part of that happened here in the mountain lions. Um, and so there's going to be a, a couple different mountain lion areas, um, 525, 555, and 565 will be combined. We're looking at a quota of six males and nine females in that area. And then the other districts, uh, 502, 515, 535, 75, and 90 um, will have a new name, and that'll be combined with a quota of 27 total cats. Um, we also had two districts that there's no changes, 540 and 580. Um, so that's why they're not on the list, but they're still out there as their own. I have a map that will pop up. Um, so there's some things statewide that are being considered. Um, and that is in these lion management units, they can be managed in a couple of different ways. And, you know, you can see here that we're looking at quotas, um, six males, nine females, 27 in the other. Um, and that's fine. They also, the commission would like to hear about a hybrid system that uses a permit for the early portion of the season and then uses a quota for the remainder of the season if that quota has not been met during the permit season. So that's one that uh, they're, they're bringing up for discussion. I think probably more so in some of those Western regions, um, but we certainly have uh, plenty of cats out here too. And uh, so opportunity there. And then also looking at how to uh, manage the uh, licenses for the hound folks. So 40 of the D4 non-resident hound licenses can be issued that are valid during the mountain lion hunting season and no more than two of those issued in the groupings of lion management units that have been in prior seasons. So if anybody's got uh, thoughts on that, I will uh, jump to the mountain lion map, but uh, recognize that we are got that language in the back. So anybody have any thoughts, questions, or things to add for mountain lion? Can't typed. Um, are those the quotas? Are those quotas the same quantities that were used in 2021? Uh, Matt? Sean, Matt? Uh, we did change it. Is Sean on there? Yeah. Go uh, ahead, Sean. 
So in the combined 525, 565, 555, um, we made some change. It, that that was that was a that was a situation where we had a total quota and a female sub quota. What we what our intent is with these proposals is to reduce the male harvest somewhat to uh, to bring about an increase in in male ages. Um, over the years, we've had a significant decline in uh, old age male, older age male in the along the bear tooth face. Uh, we've had some complaints about that from the sportsmen. Um, so we're looking at reducing the male harvest to um, increase overall age, give an opportunity to take older, older males. But at the same time, um, we've had, particularly in the Western portion of the region or of, of that area, uh, we've had complaints about too many lions. Um, so the, uh, the nine female quota on uh, is actually res would result in about a doubling of the female harvest um, for that area uh, to, to hopefully satisfy some of the demand for increased lion harvest, reducing total lion populations, um, but at the same time trying to increase uh, male age structure. Does that get what you were looking for there? Yep, okay. Any others on lions? All right. So black bear, I've also got a map that'll come up after this a little bit, but uh, so uh, legislatively, uh, we were told we need to have a hound hunting season in places that aren't going to be in conflict with grizzly bears and grizzly bear take. Uh, if you were to read that, uh, Region uh, 1 had a really good slide on uh, on that. So take is includes harassment. It doesn't mean that you killed the grizzly bear. It means that the dogs ran the grizzly bear or interrupted the grizzly bear. Um, and so that's, as we look at that, you know, where, where do we have potential for conflict with uh, grizzly bears? So the hound hunting season, um, that's going to be proposed or is proposed is April 15th to May 31st in the spring in the entire Black Bear Management Unit 580 and a portion of uh, the Black Bear Management Unit 510 east of Highway 310, so south of uh, Billings here. Uh, and then we need to have, if you have uh, hound hunting, you need to have a hound hunting training season, and that would be June 1st to June 15th in those same BMUs and portions. Um, there's also a requirement currently that you need to bring that animal in, the biologist or staff, yank a tooth and uh, send it in so that we can look at the age structure, um, pull off where we're at with uh, what sex it is and look at where we're at. And you need to do that uh, uh, within a couple of days. So this one, uh, you would be able as a hunter, if you harvested one, you'd have 10 days to get it either in person or mailed to us. And you would have to pull that tooth and do that. And so it would be a self-reporting. Um, with all the other information and you'd have to provide also the township range and section. And so that one is, you know, being talked about kind of across the state as well. Um, and we certainly uh, check a fair number of bears here. And it, it is one of those that if staff are out in the field, Robbie's shop gets uh, called up, they call back for a biologist or somebody. And it's not uncommon for a lot of people to be out to the four corners of the region. And so now they're trying to round up somebody to come and help with the bear. Um, so there is some some pros and cons to that. Um, it would reduce some of our our staffing requirements to have it. We are also looking if uh, this doesn't go through that we try to coordinate with some days so that people know what days we're really going to be in and do that. But that doesn't always help somebody that's passing through. So so that's that's one that's there. Um, some good and bad uh, maybe associated with that. A little bit of training. We would certainly get uh, training videos out for people. Um, you know, this is how you do it and, and where you go. Um, it isn't all that difficult, but if you break the tooth, it isn't all that useful either. So, so that's one of them that we'd like to get some comments on. Yeah. Uh, and it, yep. Mike, Doug had a, he had his hand up. He had a question. Okay. Yep. Go ahead, Doug.
You got you muted, Doug. Yeah. Doug, another trick is if you hold your space bar, supposedly that uh, takes off the microphone too. He's good now. Go ahead, Doug. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I had a question back on the Lions too on the Hound. It seems that there seems to be more and more non-resident houndsmen around. Is that is that just my understanding or does anybody have any input on that? Because, you know, growing up here and hunting black bears, it just seemed like there, it used to be never any houndsmen, but now we're getting more and more non-residents the way it appears. Can anybody add anything to that? I think that is valid, Doug. I don't know um what the actual numbers are on that but i think that is a valid statement that we are seeing more and you know in general we're seeing more um non-resident you know activity as a whole across our state and just um utilization of our resources but um that is that is a valid statement i don't like i said i don't know what those numbers are or how they compare but it's something that's being looked at brian you got a question too no, actually, I can make a comment to Doug's question. Uh, I'm not an expert on this. We've had a lot of discussions about how, I mean, especially with regards to lions in the western part of the state. So at, at, at one time, I had to go back to me. We did limit the number of non-resident townsmen tags. And then when we added the black bear, I believe we took, I think it was 80, and we, we cut that in half. So the 40 you see here for the non-resident uh, houndsmen are, are, are half of those are going to be, half of the 80 are cat, half are black bear. So I think we kept the non-resident number the same. So we did we did limit uh, or there were some limits put on non-resident houndsmen, as I recall at the commission. This is a this is two or three commission meetings ago, but it is definitely something that's being considered. And then the allocation was split between mountain lion and black bear. And Region One had a really good discussion. They that's one of their you know main targeted species. So if you were to go to the Region One one, I couldn't retain all of this stuff, but Neil went through the bear stuff really well. Um, and so you might be able to pick on it. They didn't have the uh, discussion about is it more or fewer but talked about a lot of the other things that are coming up with bears too so so and then the other one that uh, came up in this too is you know do you have comments about the map and where that overlap with grizzly bears are so as we continue this discussion i'm just going to flip to that map so you can see what's proposed for uh, 500 so that's the 520 the shaded area is a grizzly bear occupied area so over here in 510, that would be allowed. And then all of 580 is where uh, we're looking at bear hunts uh, with hounds. So, so yeah. So Doug, that kind of gets you there? Do, yeah, well, that's, yeah. One of the right. biologists might have more to add too, so. Right. Um, am I still on the mic here? Yep. Yeah, go ahead, Doug. Yeah, well. We lose him. Yep. Yeah, he's had problems with his computer overheating and popping him out. So I think it logged him off. Yeah, he his computer probably shut down. So I'm betting he uh, fires it back up and is back in here in a few minutes. So we can come back to bear bears then too, unless somebody else has got questions about bears and mound hunts. And one thing from a licensing perspective, Mike, because I dealt with this today. Um as a non-resident coming in, the only way that they can hunt with dogs in Montana is to be with a licensed outfitter or to draw one of those non-resident hound handlers. And I, I'm trying to find the numbers on that and the total number that they give out, but I want to say they did reduce that number. And I can okay. find that number if you give me just a little bit here. Okay. Yeah. When you find it, just pop back in. I'm going to move up to the next slide. We're, we're closing in here. So Migratory bird. Uh, so this is one uh, where we'd be establishing a light goose conservation order for Snow and Ross's geese in the Central Flyway. And that would be in the spring from March 1st to May 15th. So the conservation order is something that the Fish and Wildlife Service would have in place. So it's not considered a necessarily, this is a hunt, but the order would be, let's go in there and remove some of these critters because where they're getting up to their breeding grounds, they're having a lot of detrimental effects. And so they're looking at trying to reduce that population you know, we talk about elk being overabundance. They're basically saying these critters are overabundance and we want to take some opportunities and provide those for people to remove those um, and have that opportunity. So this is one that's been presented and out there for conversation as well. So if there's any questions on that, 
I can grab that. And Jim has prepped me with uh, responses for anything that he kind of anticipated. And if not, we could certainly get Jim, our, uh, our resident person, to uh, get an answer, and then we could get that to anybody tomorrow. So, so yeah. Any questions on that one? Kent had a question in the comments. Oh, Matt, are you answering that one? Yeah, I'm working on it. I'll I'll just type you an answer here, quick, Kent. Perfect. Thanks, Matt. So, do we know what quotas he's asking about? No, Quint, uh, Kent was asking a question about uh, the grizzly bear um, oh, yep. uh, and hounds and just, and I, basically I could answer that. Um, Kent, yeah, so the occupied grizzly bear areas, they, um, so we didn't, so we're keeping hounds, essentially keeping hounds away from grizzly bears and the blue areas are the occupied grizzly areas. Um, so that's why hunting district 580 and that um, eastern portion of 510 east of highway 310 were proposed um, to be the hound hunting uh, where hound hunting is allowed is because those are not known uh, grizzly bear distribution areas. So that's to keep from having those conflicts with bears and hounds. Yeah, and if Kent would like to talk to, we can get him up. So, so just pop your hand there and. Uh... Robbie will open up your mic for you. So, okay, maybe got it then. Okay. He said, thank you. So we're good to go. Thanks, okay. Kent. Good question. All right. Uh, and we have uh, no regional changes being proposed for these species, moose, bighorn sheep, mountain goat, and bison. I will let you know that we had uh, some internal conversations about uh, a mountain goat license that we have, uh, it's, in, it's only one and it's a difficult place to get. So you heard me talk about if you don't have uh, up to 50, maybe you shouldn't have it. And so there's been some complaints for these once in a lifetime type hunts that uh, you know you give out a few licenses, maybe one or a permit, one or two, and then we go there and we don't even find any animals. You know, you're just stealing our money and taking away our bonus points as being a complaint. And so it came back to us and said, hey, you guys have an area that you have one mountain goat license and you know there's it, you can stack up a few years where nobody harvests anything is this one that we should be getting rid of so we bounced it around had that conversation it is one of those areas that people put in for it they know it's rugged and they know it's tough they also know they're not going to have a bunch of other people out there doing this uh, and so people are that have harvested are happy people that haven't harvested have talked with us and they're happy um you know it it's just one of those. So we've recommended that uh, that stay, that may still come back up uh, at the end and have some discussions on that. But that was the only one that was in our district that was limited and didn't have regular harvest. Um, so, and then if Doug comes on, we'll, we'll pull this one back up to knowing that he's uh, interested in sheep and sheep information. So if not, we've been talking as well. So um, it's not to say that if you folks think there should be changes in these species that we don't want to hear about those. If you want to hear about those, please let us know uh, and the commission let them know. So, so yep. So I'm going to go through one more time uh, just to reiterate, and I think this will be an easy one on this this evening, but when you go back up through and you start looking at the best way to get to those commissioners so that they see all the information in a format that's better organized than just a typical email or something coming in is really to get onto that online comment piece and uh, crank through those and get those answered in there. Whoops, bumping that. So that is the best way. Not to say that if uh, you run into somebody and they want to send in a mail in a comment, they can drop them off here. We do have comment cards here at the office that they just ask the admin staff. They've got those there. So we don't want to have anybody feeling like, you know, I don't have a computer and you don't want to hear from me. That's not the case. Um, Happy to happy to facilitate that. Happy to take them also in by email. It just is that little bit extra effort to get those all lined up and kind of slows down getting that information is probably the biggest drawback to that. Whereas this, it's real time. The commissioners are able to log on, look at how things are stacking up and where the comments are coming from and kind of get through a lot. Um, I have heard 
uh, at the meetings, every one of the commissioners have said they can clean out their emails and it doesn't take long and it's full. They empty their phone message boxes and it's full. So they are they're getting a lot of comments and a lot of feedback on a lot of these. Um, also want to make sure that folks recognize, as uh, Commissioner Siebel said, um, you know, we want to hear from you. Well, part of that is, is what solutions, what other ideas do you have? So a recommendation. It's easy to get people to say, I don't like this and send it in. Well, if you like it, you should probably send it in too. And then why do you like it? Why don't you like it? So if you have questions, anybody, um, either the CAC folks that are here, other folks that want to share that message, feel free to call the office. Doors are open, phones are up, emails are working. So if you are trying to figure out, you know, I just not sure how to make the comment I want to make. Does it make sense? Feel free to get a hold of us. Um, it's that's what we're here for, and uh, happy to do that. So to help that help that work out and get good good information up to the commissioners so that they can make their decisions. So. Again, it closes on the 21st. We're gonna have just a little bit of time to get through those. And then the next meeting for the commission where they start to adopt these or make the changes and adopt them is on February 4th. And so there'll be information coming out for all the times and links for that. But February 4th is the next commission date for that. Hey, Mike, I got a question real quick. Yep, go ahead, Rusty. Um, is that on the, the FWP website where they can access this and go make these comments? Yep, so I will... Uh, Let's see, just jump right back. Easiest way to keep everything sharing the screen. While you're jumping back there, Mike, we've got a question about whether there'll be a place where uh, somebody can go and read all of the public comments. That public comment uh, will be available. I'm not sure in real time. I think that's a package that gets put together before it goes to the commission. Um, I don't see Ron on here or anybody from the director's office. I can follow up on that. Um, typically that stuff's available. It usually shows up at package time, but uh, I can follow up on that unless somebody else knows differently. So that's a good question, one that I haven't heard yet. So if we have who that is too, we can uh, try to get their, their contact information and let them know what the real answer is tomorrow rather than Mike shot in the dark tonight so yeah cody if if you want to uh just put in your name and phone number just type in your name and phone number and your question there i can we'll get you an answer yep and if you don't want to do that my name is mike ruggles as you see on the screen don't leave a space don't put a dot at, at mt.gov and you can shoot that to my email so mike ruggles at mt.gov um, and happy to get that going for you my uh, office number is 247-2951. You can call and leave a message. We can get that too. So, so yep. But that's a, that's a good question. So, and I know they've been available on other packets. I, the timing is the question that I have as well. So, so uh, Rusty, to get to that, you would come to our webpage. And uh, if you're not sure you're in the right place, if you just hit the bear, it's gonna take you to the home page. Scroll down, season setting 2022-2023. Click on that. And every one of these tiles is where I built the, the PowerPoint from. For instance, you wanted to go comment on mountain lions. You open up the mountain lion, you could look at the map, the master list for the changes, the master list for the, so that'd be the boundary changes. Um, the, the master list here would be what did they do in all the different regions and within the region, all the districts, the harvest history, mountain lion justifications from the biologist for the areas where those changes were made. So you could look at all that information. And then this is where you would find that and click. When you click on the done, it doesn't say, you know, we don't need your email. We don't need your name. It's great to have it. Um, we'd like to have that. So if there's, you know, something that's really interesting in there, something that's very helpful or you not quite enough, it gives the opportunity for us to reach out and go, didn't quite understand that one. We think there's some good things in here, or we're really kind of questioning where this came from. So sometimes we'll reach out and do that. Um, so having that name on there helps us try to figure out where we can catch up with you. But you hit the done and the survey monkey symbol comes up, checks and says, you know, it was sent in. And it, so, you know, right away you get that bounce back that it's done. Um, 
So that would be an example for the mountain lions, deer and elk. This is a statewide, if you wanted to get everything in one document, what happened with deer and elk, these are the two master lists there. Do the drop downs. And here you can start looking at what those are and get those done. So that, that is the place to do it. Um, we had some discussions about, could we have done this a little bit better to set it up so that the survey was all in one piece rather than there? Many folks like to focus on that one spot, one area. So that helps people get there without having to do the whole survey. But for folks that are interested in a wide range of things, it makes it a little bit more challenging. So we, we acknowledge that and we might look at how we can make that work a little differently in the future. But for now, that is the best way. And using SurveyMonkey, it's it's a nice tool that organizes that information and brings it in, makes it pretty easy to start cutting and dicing through and getting to the meat of things. So, so yep. If anybody's got any district specific stuff, happy to jump to those. I have a pile of slides behind this um, that have each one of the districts for each one of the different species, deer, elk, and antelope, uh, and then the maps that you saw for the other ones. So if there's a need for that, Now's the time. No. All right. Well, this is an unexpected pleasure because I was feeling bad that we were going to have a CAC meeting and not actually get a chance to visit with our CAC folks. So Region 6, it was nice to sit and listen to them go around the table and talk about what was going on in their areas. Um, Bob and I have been scrambling with a lot of this stuff. We have some new faces in the region. You know, Matt's not new, but in a new position. Um, we've had lots of changes kind of going on, you know, Diane retired, so Pam has moved into that position, we've been hiring front desk staff, so we've just had a lot of pieces moving, it's, uh, I don't want to throw any disrespect to the CAC, I really uh, appreciate all of you uh, taking the time to do this, and then also continuing to be on there, so if it's okay with you folks, I'd actually like to do the round table tonight, I thought we'd be pushing up to nine, so, so Bob, if you wanted to lead that, and then if Doug jumps in, we can ask him if we want to catch up on anything, but um, it would be really nice. So you could share your thoughts about what we had here tonight. Um, our typical round table, what's been going on in your area. I can tell you right now, Lake Elmo doesn't look like Lake Elmo other than it's got white snow and it's empty, except for about a 20 foot stretch of about two foot water that keeps making me nervous, but I don't think there's anything in there. We pumped it dry several times and it just kind of keeps seeping back into that place. But so that'd be the update. And I'm uh, kind of glad that we don't have uh, Ashley and Sean and Justin having to turn around and drive home tonight uh, on the roads that we have with the storm that we've gone in. So I do appreciate that we have this, but uh, yeah, a little bit bitter, not as bad as region six. They were talking about 20 to 50 below actual temperatures. Um, so even though they as well like those in-person ones, most of them are fairly happy that they were going to be able to shut the lights off and still be in their warm house. So, so with that, I'd like to turn it over and uh, Bob can maybe facilitate through in the absence of Doug and uh, go from there. So I do want to thank folks. We did have a few that reached out and said, if you really need somebody to be that chairman that we talked about, I can do it. Doug came in and said, I'm, I'm willing to do it. So if you guys want, so that's how we ended up selecting. He, he showed the enthusiasm that said, you know, you don't have to worry. I'm, I'm ruling. The other one said, if you don't have somebody, I guess I could help. So, so, yeah. And Mike, I called Doug on the phone. He was having trouble with his computer. It's overheating. And his IT specialist, who is uh, his wife, yep. said, uh, got it going for him for there for a little bit as an attendee. I saw him pop up. So he might rejoin us or he might not. So, but yeah. he didn't just leave. He, uh, he's having some computer problems. Yeah, if you want to give him a shout while we're going, I can pop him on my speaker phone too. I've got his phone number here. So if he okay. wants that, just let me know and I'll call him up. So, okay. He can call in on his phone too, Matt, if that works for him. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you. Uh, before we move on, then, does uh, anybody, either uh, any of the CAC members or anybody else, uh, have any questions or? Thoughts or anything else on the season setting that we just got that going through? If you do, uh, hold your hand up there, or click the little icon to, uh, to let us know that uh, you've got a question. Um, and uh, uh, looks like uh, Bruce, Bruce Hoyland has a question. So we can uh, go ahead, Bruce. 
Yes, I've had quite a few people asking with the numbers going up uh, in our area in the 590 and on the elk numbers and so forth. How are those numbers affected uh, when people like the Wilkes Ranch are given 20, 30 tags? Does that come out of that number or is it separate? Mike or Matt? Yeah, did Matt pop off? Matt's on the phone with Doug right now, so he's unavailable. Okay. Um, I got to apologize. I was trying to fix a technical thing happening here too. So Bruce, so you're asking about uh, the increases in numbers and where we think we'll head with those. And then what does that mean for those, uh, you know, is the access going to happen with this proposal and kind of what's our, our crystal ball on that? Well, the main thing people are asking if, if the numbers are increased to say 330 either sex tags and the department decides to give the Wilkes Ranch uh, another 30 tags next year, does that lower the number to 300 tags for the public? So right now the, uh, the only tags that are out, so it's a, it's a one for three more on those 454s. So the first tags, they're not there. We're having discussions about whether or not those will. The one of the directives that the commission gave our director was, we need to get a format squared away. One that speaks to timing to get these in, make sure they actually qualify, and then how to address whether or not those are off the top or where they're coming from. But right now, those don't come out of the quota. So they're additive to the quota. We're so far over objective. You know, it really doesn't make much difference biologically in those. But then there's the other three tags that come for each one of those that they get through that 454 that are part of that quota. So there is a piece there that uh, comes from the quota. So, yep. Yeah. And I've talked to a couple of folks, uh, landowners down in the muscle shell that, uh, you know, their struggle is, is that it typically is, you know, we want a bull for the ranch. And so we have to give one bull and then two cows. Well, all I have are bulls that are tearing up my haystack and in my cornfields. And so that doesn't really do any good. And so I've talked with the director a little bit about that going, is there latitude to not just have cows, but maybe the next three be bull licenses, which would still need to come out of that, the quota list and the licenses that were available. But that's something that maybe we can address with some of those that, you know, they've, they've struggled to be able to get under a more limited number hunters that would actually come to them with a bull. It was easy for them to find people banging on the door for cows, but, you know, when they were looking for somebody to come for a bull, believe it or not, they were struggling. So, so that's one I've heard in the Muscle Shell Valley there. So, so yep. Yeah. Hey, uh, did that answer your question, uh, Bruce? Uh, yes, it did. That uh, was answered really well. I know that if you're coming up to 13th to have a public meeting, I would prepare for that question. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, if you see them, we're going to do it here at the office. So we've had a couple of them that have called. If you have somebody that's going, why don't they come up here? You know, the reason why we didn't make the lap and get it all planned is we typically have only gotten one or two at most of the meetings. And it's not uncommon for us to get there and have nobody show up. Um, and so we, we went with the virtual side, but kept our ears open for opportunity. If it's one or two, the, it's gonna be easiest for us to just have a phone conversation and uh, go that way rather than round everybody up and come that way. Um, if we had uh, a real big push, we could come back and consider. And that's kind of where we're at with the, the Billings one. So we're hoping people can make that in for that, for the ones that don't really like the Zoom format at all. So, so yep. Very good. Thank you. Um, Steve Beagle has a question, has his hand up. Can we unmute him? There you go. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, Mike, um, I, these questions are somewhat generic but I, I think they're specific enough to the to the uh, uh, wildlife management uh, uh, revisions to ask it um, a number of people including myself have some very uh, 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 far-reaching questions something that doesn't include just area five uh, hunting district 510 for instance um, if somebody wants to include a, a comment um, 
pretty much region wide. Can they just go in and check every hunting district box and uh, put in their comment uh, in that regard? There doesn't seem to be any general comment location. It's all seems to be tailored to specific hunting districts. So that's yep. a three part question. That's the first part. Yep. That yep. So that, that, that's fair. So that one that has all the districts listed in there, um, you can click on one or you can click on them all or you don't have to click on any and you can still type a comment in that'll get shot in and say this is coming from whatever area that we were asking that question on. And so it'll provide whatever information is there. So very flexible in that doesn't okay. require that the box be clicked or not. And you can click multiple. So I think that covers the question for that one. And the other ones have, you know, the one liners basically, and then click. So. Right. That's great. Well, the other thing is maybe you can help me cut the chase because I've gotten some questions and I certainly have them too about, uh, for instance, the uh, fairly recent uh, Supreme Court decisions as far as Crow Tribe having open hunting rights um, uh, in, in, you know, historic Crow country. Um, so part of that question is, do you know, is that question over to any other tribes in Montana or is that specific to the Crow Tribe? I might kick that one to Matt. I could venture in there a little bit, but I have a level of uncertainty, so. Yeah, Mike, I was uh, just, you're gonna have to summarize that question for me again. I was just typing a answer for Brad here. Go yeah, ahead. So the Crow Tribe uh, traditional hunting grounds that are beyond the, the current reservation boundary. Yeah. So we know we, we've got that going on. Are there other tribes that also have hunting grounds outside of their, their area, outside their, their reservations? You know, you the know, bison hunts, they definitely pull those in on the gardener piece, but beyond that. Yeah, you know, in Western Montana, um, I believe there were some from some of the Western Montana tribes that extended down uh, the Bitterroot Valley some. You know, a really good guy to be asking and answering this question would be Ron Howell. Ron had an extensive, Ron has an extensive um, uh, background and knowledge of, of these topics. And boy, we can sure get you an answer from Ron on that. Yeah. And, and the I history, the history on those is that those were individually negotiated yeah. um, in time. And yeah, so those were negotiated, like Mike's saying, in the individual treaties with you know, specific tribes have their own specific treaties as well. So that can be pretty variable, but there are other, there are other tribes that do have um, hunting grounds. Yep. So uh, well, Steve, think, Matt will follow up with Ron and uh, get you an answer. Thank you. And then the yeah. other part of that question is uh, specific to region five then, um, you know, the, the, the priors are kind of a delicate situation with chronic wasting disease and a lot of other things. So there's some questions and some some thoughts about uh, 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 managing mule deer, for instance, and the priors with chronic wasting disease in mind, as well as some other things in mind. So there'll be some comments coming in on that. But one of the questions is, how much of the the the, the best management thoughts and practices and and regulations and uh, 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 dynamic um, is taking into account uh, the real or potential effects of this decision for the Crow Tribe. I mean, if they want to hunt the priors year round, they can. If they want to hunt technically, the way it seems to, to me and to others is from Yellowstone Park to the Dakota line and from into Wyoming, north beyond the Yellowstone, any time of the year, all year long. Does that Has that been taken into account in any of your management? And are you in, in uh, good uh, communication with the Crow Tribe Fish and Game as far as that real or potential issue goes. Yep, so uh, current position, no, not personally yet. As an agency, yes, we've had those conversations um, and we're there. We've also trained with them for uh, taking CWD samples uh, and worked with them on that for the landscape piece. Um, and uh, you know, it's the unoccupied lands so, you know, they, they can't be out on the ranches out in that traditional area, but, you know, the real discussion has been on those public lands, BLM, state, and forest. And in Montana, we've said, yep, those are open. And so we have taken that into account. I'm guessing that Sean or Matt probably have uh, the updated answer and probably leaning towards Sean, but Matt, you might have it too. So I know you've worked with them pretty extensively. So, yeah, I don't know. That's, uh, 
as of late, you know, we haven't, and I don't really know how much hunting they're actually doing um, outside. That's kind of a little hard to measure. Um, but, you know, none of that's, I don't really feel like the communication's been uh, good enough with them to really update that information from what it was a couple of years ago when um, those decisions went through. Sean might have more on that. Yeah, so Steve, that's on our to-do list once we get caught up kind of where we're at and in being in new positions to to re regalvanize those discussions with folks down there. So John, okay. you want, got anything to add? I don't have anything, no. Okay, thanks. So if we did want to uh, submit some comments, just do the same thing that I talked about previously. Any areas that look like they might be affected, check the boxes, include the comment and the question about that particular item with regard to all of those areas that uh, were checked on the on the website form. Yep, and if it doesn't quite fit, you know, ideas coming in by emails for future discussion reference too, that works really well as well. So if you're thinking, yeah, I don't know how this one just dives right in there, that email option might be the, the way to go too, so. That's great to know too, thank you very much. Yep. We have Doug back on here. He called in on his phone though, just so you know, Mike. Okay. Okay. We can ask Doug if he's, we're wrapping up with any more questions on this and then we'll uh, make a round table run and, and do that. So uh, you can unmute him or it's star six. Yeah, if you can hear me, Doug, hit star six. Mike, just so you know, I, while we're kind of waiting for Doug there, uh, Brad had that same question about um, where the public comments on all these proposals can be viewed. <clears throat> and I just typed in to Brad for anybody else that didn't hear the answer earlier on that, um, that you and you'd be getting a hold of the folks up in Helena that kind of compile those answer or compile those comments and put them together in a format that that hadn't been done yet, but uh, that you'll be looking for an answer for that question as to where people can go and view and review and read through those comments. Yep. Can you hear us, Doug? Yeah, can you hear go me? Go ahead. Yep, you're on, go ahead. Well, I, po I apologize. Uh, that's what happened when you got prehistoric equipment, I guess it dies on you at the, when you're not expecting it. But getting back to the bears, that's where 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 I had a question there or comment there. Uh, it seems like um, the folks I've talked to, the bear and the hound hunting, has really got a lot of lot of lot of issues, and uh, everybody's wondering how that all happened. And I tried to explain it to them, and and again tell them to make sure they get their comments in, but. It seems to be that it's confusing yet why we're in this area why the proposal is to have hound hunting with all the private land and and the grizzly overlap and everything. So I just was gonna throw that out. And I think you covered some of that already. And maybe you maybe you did talk about that when I was trying to get going here again so thank you and again I apologize for the inconvenience yep no doug uh you know neil anderson up in region one you know really knows the bears and all the ins and outs on that um if you were to look at theirs he's really got some good stuff but for us it, it really was and uh, the biologist can fix me if i'm lead, leading anybody astray here but you know we needed to stay out of the grizzly bear area that was pretty easy easily defined out of some previous work uh, and so it opened up uh that portion of 510 and 580. So the, the hound piece was a legislative piece. So that part isn't up for us to say hound hunting or not. It's like where. And then also within that, the commission is asking, do you think that the grizzly bear occupation map is a, a suitable map or is there more work that maybe needs to be done on that too? So so those are up for uh, for comments and discussion, um, but that's kind of where we ended up and followed those boundaries and and uh, 
ours is, you know, Sean ends up going out and Kylie, uh, we look at uh, where there's conflict, things like that. So, so yeah, Brian, it sounds, looks like you've got a little ad. So. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Just a little follow on comments that we've had a lot of discussion, a lot of controversy, uh, you know, this is legislative, but you know, region one was one of the areas that was really pushing it or people there. And most of the region got closed and there, there's discussion about uh, at least at least a lot of comment about whether there's areas there within those regions that could be open or it's open at certain times of hound hunting because it's just a broad swath. Because a lot of this is not necessarily, you know, where grizzlies are all the time, just where they can be occasionally encountered. And I guess I would say the same thing for the area of 520. Uh, if if people think or if, if the, the department and, and especially the, the local region thinks that there's potential for areas within 520 that, that could be open because, you know, there's a lot of overlap between habitat, uh, you know, that would be something we'd like to hear about as well. If there's a if there's a better breakdown than these entire swaths, because I'm not sure. Uh, I know there can be grizzlies and I certainly have, have experienced them uh, in 520. But uh, that's something else that we're looking at, too, is whether or not because there's an awful lot of the state that's, that's closed now that down hunting and in. It's definitely an effective tool for black bears. And uh, so be open to looking at those, those options as well in, in five points. Thanks, Commissioner. All right. So any we did. Other question, other questions or thoughts uh, uh, by uh, any of any, uh, the folks on the CAC or uh, of those others that are listening? We might take this uh, opportunity then to uh, do what we've uh, uh, come to enjoy about our uh, Citizen Advisory uh, Council, and that is to do an around the table and, and hear from uh, each of those members as to what is going on in their piece of the world. Um, and so, uh, uh, Lee, would you like to get started today? Yeah, I'd be happy to start. Can you hear me? I can hear you. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I've just got a few things. Um, I got quite a few questions about uh, when we're going to do a new elk management plan. Uh, so that's that's something that I would actually be personally interested in uh, finding that out as well. Uh, I also have a question. When, when landowners in our region ask for relief, say from too many elk, uh, does, does the, uh, do we respond to that? How, how does that work? You know, somebody says I've got, you know, too many elk in my haystacks. Um, I know there's a game damage uh, hunt that goes on. Is that something that uh, the department deals with immediately or is that uh, later on? So I didn't know the answer to that question, to be honest with you. So maybe I could get an answer there. Yep, I can take a stab or if uh, Matt or one of the biologists want to take a stab at that, that's that's great too. So you we want it, Matt? Or? Yeah, I can start speaking to that, Lee. So typically how that occurs is, you know, a person will come in and, you know, if the question is, hey, I just have too many elk on my land, I need uh maybe some assistance or can we what what can we do about that you know one of our first responses will be um we might go out and assess that or or visit with them about it but also um we may talk to them about some opportunities for hunters you know during the hunting season to come out and uh maybe harvest those elk and putting putting some hunting pressure on some of those elk to move them early um, if they're in a, an area that has the early shoulder season, say they're, um, for example, they have issues with elk on third cutting alfalfa, for example, in August. They're, you know, in situations like that, um, you know, if that shoulder season is open there, you know, during that early period, um, we can definitely help and try to route some hunters to them for things like that. If there's someone that already, you know, allows public hunting and say they're having haystack damage or something like that um, during season, obviously, um, we, you know, we have some tools to help um, go out 
and ass assess those issues with hunters. If they're having issues out of season and they qualify, you know, they allow public hunting or, a, you know, not a overly restricted amount of public hunting on their place during the season. And these are times, say, for example, later um, out of season where they're experiencing damage, it may be in, for example, March or something like that. Um, those are investigated um, within a 48 hour period, or at least the person is contacted, excuse me, contacted within a, a 48 hour period under the game damage policies and um, moving forward, uh, we go out, uh, either a biologist or a warden typically goes out to the site, looks at the damage um, and tries to come up with, you know, some form of solution that will help. Many times if it's a haystack, uh, we do have a specific hay yard fencing, um, basic, package, I guess, for a lack of a better term, that um, the department can provide to folks that qualify. And, you know, they can put that, basically, they get those materials. It's, you know, some woven wire and some posts for a certain dimension that they can put around the stacks. Um, other methods that we use may be um, hazing. We've actually hired, in some cases, hazers to go out and um, move animals that typically is not a real common one that we use it's just difficult to find people and many times it's um it's not a real a real good answer um propane cannons you know scare away guns have limited you know have some limited um uh utilization on situations like that but overall we really try to to uh, manage, you know, damaging animals, um, depredating animals with with hunters, and 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 even the presence of hunters, and you know, putting for, you know, it might sound a little bit morbid, but putting some gut piles and some blood on the ground a lot of times will help, you know, deter some of those animals. Sure. There's also um, a potential for game damage hunts. Um, if we have historic hunts, those are historic areas where, you know, we're having game damage problems. Um, some of those hunts can be um, foreplanned and uh, hunters can actually get on a game damage roster. And when that, when those um, instances start occurring year after year, um, if they're on the roster for that particular area, they'll get called up and can go in and hunt and um also there are some you know at times we do do some kill permits um and kill permits are basically we take a look again those these are investigated areas where a biologist or a warden will go out and take a look at the damage that's occurring and um, if elk for example are only coming in at night and damaging a crop at night um um, sometimes those kill permits are given out and we actually, there's actually a harvest of animals at night by the landowner or by a FWP employee um, due to, uh, due to the, uh, a lot of times timing and um, the busyness of some of the employees, a lot of times the uh, landowner or landowner agent will actually do the killing on those kill permits and we help with collecting the animals um, and getting those to the proper food bank or, um, you know, allocating those animals out appropriately to public that, that needs those animals. So, you know, that I hope, Lee, I kind of answered your um, question in general. We do have game damage policy. There are game damage laws. And boy, if you ever need that material or you want that material, or I can certainly send that out and point you in the, in the right direction or maybe forward you some of those links to look at some of that. I appreciate it. I didn't have any idea about the uh, hazing part of that. So thank you. Yeah, and like yeah, I said, I, I, hazing isn't used a lot, Lee. It's really, <laughs> it, and mainly because it's a manpower issue and it's, it's really hard to find, you know, the manpower and people to kind of get out there and, and do that at times. But it is a tool that has been used and uh, it's still used in some circumstances, but it really... It's really kind of one that has to, it's a per, it's a specific 
prescription for certain instances. I'll say it that way. And okay. Yeah. Yeah. I got there's a sign-up process on that too, Lee. So the biologist and warden works together uh, to come up with a plan, make a recommendation, goes into a system, kicks out an email to the wildlife manager, the regional supervisor. Um, we take a peek at it before everything goes out. Um, the commissioners get a, a note looking for, uh, hey, a thumbs up, thumbs down, or questions. And so it does kind of run up that chain pretty quickly and then back out too. So, so it's not okay. just a on the ground. Yep. Here we go. Kind of thing, but right. almost. Yep. I, I sure appreciate it. I hate to take up too much more time, uh, but I, I got a couple other things I'd like to um, talk about. Uh, the block management is just uh, wildly popular with the people I talk to. Um, and the landowner, one of the things that uh, I heard was we, we don't know what to say to the landowner. You know, how do we get a hold of them? Well, uh, you you can get their addresses and send them a thank you note, <laughs> you know? So uh, I think that would be pretty appreciated. And uh, I'm gonna do that a lot more than I have in the past. Uh, another thing, um, what I, <laughs> I had uh, some folks that just absolutely love the uh, muzzleloader season. Uh, wildly, wildly enthusiastic about it, I might say. Uh, I don't know if anybody else is like, like that, but. Uh, There's one smiling really like at that. you with a, <laughs> with a light that keeps shutting off in his office. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and that was a real surprise. I didn't actually know that that was coming down the pike. I really like simplifying the regulations, and I will say that uh, there's a lot of people that have spoken to me and said that uh, that's long overdue, so I, I really think that's been uh, well received out there. Yeah, um, Lee, just real quick on that muzzleloader season, you know, that's something that came out of legislative action, so that's kind of a neat opportunity that came out of the legislature, that heritage muzzleloader season, just, just as another FYI for you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, I'll get back to that. A uh, couple of people talked to me about that. Um, they want to they want to extend that season, of course. All right. Um, the last thing I have is uh, on a question. What's the most effective idea you guys have heard about about controlling the elk numbers? So you're asking about in the over objective areas? Yeah. Yep. You know, so the most effective way is getting rid of those animals likely through hunting or other means where they're right but how do we get to them i guess is what i'm telling yeah. you asking yeah so that's the that's the million plus dollar question um so this this commission is looking at it and our director with some intention roiled things up uh, to get people to the table and there's you know talking with uh, commissioner siebel earlier they're getting some some additional ideas pretty good ideas coming in that they're looking at but you know what, what's been out there hasn't necessarily been working. And uh, so we'll, we'll see, you know, we, we can, you know, kind of prophesize what we think might happen with these regulations if they were to go through and how much that will open that up and what the 454 program does and maybe some others that uh, incentivize that. You know, there's going to be working group that's also devoting a little bit of time. And, you know, I don't know if we, we have a simple answer for you at this moment. And, uh, but that's definitely be working on. But that is the million dollar question. That's sure. That's that's where we're at. So all right. Thank you. One yep. uh so uh yeah, I appreciate the time. I appreciate you guys. Uh you know, it's 8 30 at night. I know you guys have had a long day, so uh I'll, sh I'll shut it down there. But thanks again for doing this and for all the other meetings you guys have done. Yeah, no, thanks, Lee. And Kent, I just want to let you know, once we get through the wrap up, uh, we'll quick hit that 575 question for you, too. So. Very good. Thank you. Uh, we're, I'm going to take an opportunity before we lose them again to uh, uh, to hear from Doug. You're on, Doug. Thank you. OK. Uh, really, all I heard in the last, of course, big game season was a vast number of hunters that everybody experienced out in the field. And of course, I think COVID has a lot to do with that. And when and if it, COVID ever goes away, maybe we'll get kind of back to the norm. But uh, I'm just like everybody else, just holding a breath to see what happens there. Um, so that it, that was the main issue this, this season. Um, 
the question there, I, I want to follow up on just a question on that, on that elk. Um, have you guys in the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks any reports of elk uh, depredation? I mean, de- elk depredation as far as on crops and that this winter? Yep, we've already had uh, some game damage reports. Um, the late season hunts help with that to some extent, but yeah, we've had some requests for some stack yards. So, yep, it's it's kind of starting. So. Yeah, okay. Well, you know, it's supposed to get nice uh, next week. Maybe we'll continue to have some nice weather, but it's been pretty, pretty, pretty tough here lately. And I, what I see here, just in the game birds around my place, they're, they're scratching for something to eat. But that's all I have uh, other than, you know, what we've been talking about here for the last couple of weeks. And that's got a lot of interest, uh, more than I've ever seen before on the season settings and that. So uh, I guess we'll see how it all shakes out in the end. Thank you again. Yeah, oh, thank you, Doug. Thanks, Doug. Uh, Susan, you want to go? Well, I just wanted to thank you for the really good presentation. I mean, I'm not, I, I don't follow everything that's in there by any means, but um, I do appreciate all the work that went into that. And I actually think that the survey monkey thing is a pretty good idea. So I'm glad you've, you've gone to that. Um, as far as issues, I don't have anything to bring up. Um, I'll be curious maybe in the future to hear how the low water and the cold temperatures might have impacted the fisheries this year, but um, we can talk about that another time. So thanks. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Kahan. Hey, thank you. Um, Yeah, I I guess um, I'll follow along with Susan. It's impressive with the amount of work you've all done on this. Um, I'd also like to thank Mike and his, his office for their continued cooperation, working with our students, doing a variety of different projects and um, research around town and especially, you know, really um, the opportunity for students to do uh, get hired, to do internships, to, uh, to do volunteer work. There's a lot of students that we've had that have come up um, working through, you know, working game check stations as volunteers and getting hired on at that. And then we now have students that are employed throughout the state. So that's, I think that's a great, you know, opportunity and, and an avenue for students to get into a professional field like this. And I teach a, a wildlife management course at Rocky Mountain College. I'm also a really avid hunter, mostly mostly bird hunting, but I hunt big game as well. So I'm in I'm in favor of the um, I guess extending the the bird season um, for the non game for well for the non native species I guess. So the part the the partridge and the pheasants. But I, I have some concerns about the some of the native grouse, um, particularly just and I've heard this from quite a few other bird hunters. The um, with the extended wolf trapping season, or the, the extension of the wolf trapping season, and potential conflict with with bird dogs for that, um, I wasn't sure if you'd had any f- other comments like that. Um, concerns about you know bird dogs getting caught in wolf snares. And... You know, I haven't had those directly in the office. I've heard those before. If uh, Commissioner Siebel wants, I bet she's heard some of those. But uh, yeah, that might be just enough too. So, so yeah. No, it's it's definitely one of those that uh, pops up in general. So, um, I do, I, and I, I know I brought this up a few years ago, but I wonder if there's any thoughts still on um, a student hunting and fishing license, some kind of discount for that. That we have had that in the past, but I don't think we currently have anything like that. Yep, and that's uh, just as a reminder, that's a legislative piece. So, right. Okay. Yep. Um, I've heard from other hunters just, you know, concerns about CWD and, you know, people wondering if they're going to continue hunting. And I, I just wonder if there's not an opportunity here to, you know, educate people. It looks like some of the, some of the changes that you have going through are actually targeting reducing predator numbers. It sounds like that's what you mentioned with, with the mountain lions. And it, it definitely seems that way with wolves and I'm, I'm assuming with bears. I didn't hear if that, there's a quota change with the black bears. Is that is that true? Or has the quota gone up now that we've added hounds? Is it hounds plus regular or is it still the same quota? So Kahan, those are still the same quotas. It'll just be the, the hounds that are, or bears that are killed with the use of hounds. Um, 
those would be required to be called in so that those bears would also apply to the quota and it would just um, could potentially close down the season. Um, depending on when they're killed, they could, could, could potentially close down the season sooner, but it would, okay. they would all be operating as a, as a hunter on the same quota. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I still think it's a good, a good opportunity to educate the general public about the importance of predators on the landscape and, and predators helping maintain healthy ungulate populations. I think there's there's just a you know I have my students in my wildlife class have asked me that many times you know why are we not in some cases using predators as a management tool as well um, instead of trying to you know really heavily manage these systems let's let, let predators do their job particularly predators like uh, bears that might scavenge more on dead game for instance. That's I think that's all I've got. Thank you. Yeah. So, Kayon, I might uh, try to catch up with you here uh, in the next week or two to visit about potentials for students coming in to help. Uh, you know, so I mentioned, you know, it was one of the examples, the antelope hunting districts changing numbers and people coming in. So we're thinking about using our office, the meeting space to set up maps, have stations, people come in before they get up in March for licensing to make the lap through. You know, this is my question what we could do and we're going to be shorthanded. Um, and we have some new staff up front too. So we were kind of bouncing around the idea that if we had a couple of students that could dedicate a little bit of time, it'd be good one-on-one -on -one as uh, folks come through to kind of get to visit with hunters and, and then help out too. So I, I do want to, that's on my radar to catch up with you. So if you get a chance, let's, let's see if we can touch base. Yeah, that sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. On uh, Rusty. Yeah, I think the biggest thing that I've been hearing is um, people being disgruntled with these proposals, you know, and, and I get it, like I'll preface that with, from my perspective, I, I get it's a balancing act between, you know, the public, the landowners and keeping the, the numbers in check, but there is a good argument that it seems like some of those proposals are um, steps towards privatizing hunting, privatizing public resources, and I guess the crowd I hang out with, that's, that's kind of their perspective on it. And that, that's only one perspective on in it. And I totally get that. Um, but what I've seen this year personally, and what I've got a lot of feedback is someone mentioned, it, I don't remember who it was, but yeah, just a lot of pressure. And it, I thought it was interesting because I get those emails from you from the check stations. And it seems like they're like numbers have trended down except for the, the Levina check station. Um, that one seemed to hold pretty close to the average. But yeah, and, and I think like there's just access issues is the biggest thing. That's the root of the whole problem. I mean, with exploding populations and everything, like you, if you can't get hunters on the landscape and every part of the landscape, then it's always going to be an issue. And I think that, I don't know, is the biggest issue. But from like from a hunting perspective and the people, I hang out with mostly hunters. So uh, that's the best perspective I have. But yeah, it's just access and a lot of pressure, a lot of out-of-staters. I mean, good God. I, I didn't even hunt our district this year except for waterfowl. But um, yeah, the breaks at one point, I, I could have swore that I was the only Montanan left in the breaks because there was nothing but Washington tags around me. And um, I guess the general complaint is what they're harvesting, like not mature bucks. I mean, I get it, uh, a four piece of four pea, but they got to grow up if you, if you want them to grow. I think that's another thing is like the let them grow concept. Not a lot of that, it seems like. Um, and that's not just out of staters, that's everybody, but it, it tended tend to kind of fit that stereotype but other than that no like I, I thank you for the presentation tonight to end on a positive note I, I think that sounded kind of negative what I just said and unfortunately but um the, the presentation was great I think some of these proposals like what I saw tonight I'm excited as a hunter I think they look pretty awesome and uh yeah yeah that's all I got all right hey thanks Rusty I do thank want to take a quick one since we moved through Susan I've been wanting to catch up with you to ask about students as well so so if you have some in mind, that'd be helpful, so. Very good, thank you. Uh, Bruce, you wanna take another shot here? Sure. We've really had an unusual year on the Muscleshell River with the drought and all the fires. Uh, after the first two weeks of bow season, I don't know anybody could find an elk in the Muscleshell River. And where all those critters have gone, nobody knows and whether they come back or not it may take care of 
some of that 200% over objective. And it's really a big deal. Now, we also had record numbers of out-of-state hunters on the mussel shell. Uh, first time in my life that I can remember during our hunting season, you could not get a motel room in Roundup. Uh, years ago, hell, when I was 15, 16 years old, the first two days of hunting season were that way, but not the whole year. And I kind of think these out-of-state hunters are here to stay. We're going to have to prepare for it. Oh, thanks, Yep. We've heard a lot of that across the state. And you also need to be mindful that uh, we have a lot of new residents. And so that's something that, uh, you know, we've had a pretty good bump in that. So it's, it's, it's going to be a dance we'll be working on here for a while, I think. So we've seen that in our school system here in Roundup. We have the highest number of children in our schools that I think we've ever had. There's mm -hmm. over 300 students in our elementary. And those folks are darn sure new, but uh, the New York and East Coast people in your hunting this year were unbelievable how many came. And I don't blame them for wanting to get out. I mean, yeah. I... no, thanks for that, Bruce. Thanks. Steve, you get to wrap it up here tonight. Okay, thank you. And that, that's a good start. I really, I and everybody that I've talked to really appreciate the extension through January 20 for comments. Uh, it does give people time to get some more input, including meetings like this. Real good meeting. Thanks for all the prep. Um, and you know, there's quite a few people I know that are going to be upset and complaining about some of the elk regs and, and that, but quite a few of them too uh, want to compliment Fish, Wildlife, and Parks and staff for the science. For getting back, getting into the science and doing their best to keep you know personal and, and political biases out of the way and working with the science. So I'm going to encourage them to put that in writing, but if they don't send it in, at least you know I'm hearing that. So thanks. Um, the uh, uh, I do want to, especially with Commissioner Siebel here too, to just emphasize that um, on game habitat and native species, you know, across the board, uh, really deserve an awful lot of help and a lot of attention. I mean, you know, I, I love to hunt elk and I love elk and deer and everything else, but citizen advisory council meetings are a lot like everything else that you folks hear. It's elk, 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 deer, and other things. Non-game species, native species, and habitat. Really need all the help we can get them. Um, uh, and I do want to thank Fish, Wildlife, and Parks for cooperative efforts. I mean, we just finished up a, a project on the Washable Wildlife Grant that we got um, Megan O'Reilly and, and uh, Christine and uh, Lori Nuska Brown uh, helped out a lot with that. We got some other things in the works. I hope Region Five continues to support that. The commissioner and everybody else, you know, does that too. It's a win-win situation. It's been a real good collaboration between Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and NGOs. I mean, I'm, you can't lose, as far as I'm concerned. A um, couple other real quick ones. I want to emphasize Lee's, a couple of Lee's points. He's right. I talk to, uh, I hunt block management. I, I really love hunting public land, but I also, I like to hunt. So I also hunt block management areas. I haven't talked to a block management landowner yet that hasn't either expressed uh, that they have received a written letter and appreciate it, or that wouldn't appreciate a written letter. So if you can encourage friends, relatives, and others to let these people know in writing, I mean, you know, email is good and a thank you after you leave the hunt. That's good. But good old fashioned weather kind of goes a long way for a lot of people, too. Um, and then uh, uh, Lee's point on elk hunting access. I know it's a million dollar question. I know it's a billion dollar problem, um, but it really, really does deserve all the attention we can give to it to try to make a, get a better, better situation there. Uh, my last thing is Zoom ain't so bad. You know, with, with winter weather, distance, and COVID, um, I would like to meet in person too, but I'm really glad you guys have got such a slick system um, in Zoom, and Bob and everybody that contributes to that, hats off to you. It works well. Thank you. That's it. 
Hey, right, Steve, thanks. Steve, before you pop off here, I, I just have a note and I want to make sure that I'm, I'm uh, following up on everything I needed to follow up on for you. But um, the two main topics I had were tribal hunting grounds. Um, you wanted some information on that. And I was going to talk with Ron and might even get Ron in touch with you directly. And the other thing was CWD management efforts with the tribe. Are that is that correct? Yeah, that'd, that'd be great. If, if you happen to uh, I think you can help me cut the chase on uh, information about uh, uh, the grouse issue and the extended hunting season. Just build on what you heard tonight. I sure appreciate that too, but thank you, Matt. You betcha. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Um, Commissioner Siebel, do you want to uh, have the last word this evening? Thanks, Bob. Yeah, I don't need to have the last word, but I would like to say a few things and appreciate all the comments from the CAC members. And I do want to, I, I don't know if the question that Lee had was addressed about the elk management plan. I'm not sure if we, we addressed that as first part of this question. Yep, and uh, yep. we, I, I did ask that question at our working meeting on the 13th because we are working off the elk management plan from 2005. And I was promised uh, the new elk management plan will be done by 2023, probably mid, mid year, they're saying April, May of 2023. The commission's already approved essentially the guiding principles for that, for that working group that's going to, <laughs> There's a working group put together to put together guiding principles for the working group that's going to put together the elk management plan, and that'll be you know a cross section of people, and so uh, so it's going to be a couple more years. So that's why you know this is really important. We've got two years of season before we have a new plan in our hands to uh, to uh, to work on with elk. I will say too uh, to to point that I think that Lee and and, and Rusty and several others made um, and it, with with regards to Steve made as well with regards to access. One of the things I think that the new commission, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're six out of seven people are new or appointed by the, by the new governor. And I think we have a different philosophy than, than has been around in the past. And, and a lot of that philosophy is, you know, uh, I think you know, we, we, you know, I have friends, I, you know, of course I, I hunt a lot. My, my coworkers and I, we talk about hunting all the time. We're passionate. I got coworkers that say, you know, Hey, I'm anti-outfitter. I don't want this. I don't like this and like that. Cause I mean, they say I'm anti-outfitter and I say, you know, I can't be anti-outfitter. I don't want to be. That's 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 not where where I need to be because we have to look at all the all the interested parties. And I think what you'll see from our commission is is more of a balanced approach and really looking more at the, the carrot versus the stick instead of trying to force access by changing things or or, or doing things that you know that that were done in the past. We really want to look at ways to incentivize landowners because that's the only way we're going to get landowners to let people on is to make it worth their while and in in. How, however we decide to do that and we're looking for creative ideas to do that so i would encourage everyone to to uh, you know submit those comments uh, obviously now for season setting but more importantly you know submit those comments send those to me if you have if you have ideas on, on ways and especially there's landowners represented here if you have ideas on, on, on ways that would incentivize you uh you know to let other to let more hunters on or you think would help other people that i would really encourage people to do that and uh, i do want to Thank as well. I just want to say thanks to the Region Five office. You guys did a great job. This is uh, all the regions did a, a, a tremendous amount of work. Region Five, uh, I think, did, did, did a whole lot of work, did a lot of changes, and really listened to the, the directives of the, of the director to really try to simplify things. So you guys did great work, and, and I really appreciate the process tonight, and appreciate being able to participate. And look forward to uh, being with everyone in person one of these days soon. So thank you guys. Oh, thanks. And Bob, we did have one more question that popped up about five seventy five, and and uh, I how that went that one. uh mike i think i got that one if it was kent greer yep so why don't you go ahead and uh, just let people know so the question was is how did we settle on uh, general elk license in uh, 575 and you know glad that it's there but just wondering what was behind it so matt if you just want to give a quick run through that'd be great okay yeah so the question on the 575 um was basically um what we, how we justified going to either sex in that district um and sean sean can jump in here and correct me if i'm wrong but uh in the elk plan from 2005 which is you know obviously a fairly outdated elk plan there was not language for the management of over older age class bulls for hunting district 575 um also the elk abundance in that district has increased over time. Um, originally, those numbers were probably low enough that um, those permits were put in place to basically manage um, for opportunity for folks to um, harvest bulls 
on a limited basis, but you know, so that folks could have a a uh, hunt that would um, that they could enjoy, but also um, that the population and the dynamic of the population would be as far as bull to cow ratios and things like that would be in check. So um, it's an over objective district. And um, so those were some of the big um, things we looked at and going to either sex in that district is just there is an abundance of elk there. And um, we weren't, our hands weren't tied, so to speak, in with language, for example, from managing for older, older age class bull. And it was an opportunity that we had to go to either sex in that district. If Sean, if you have some more to add on that, or if I said anything that was incorrect in my, uh, my approach to that, uh, feel free to join in. Yeah, I think you, you covered most of it. Um, the, elk plan, the elk plan has an objective for hunting district 575, I believe of 225 elk. Um, in recent years, we've been counting between, typically between 900 and 1,000 now. So we're about four times over objective. And, um, you know, that's, uh, that, that was one of the primary drivers for, for that decision. Thanks. And I see we got one more asking about crop depredation. If we record if the adjoining landowners allowed no hunting or only fee hunting, and that is not collected as part of that process. So we do have the locations and where that's at, the ranch that we're working with or the, the landowners. And so that, that part's in there, but no, we're not looking at that piece. So looks like Matt's getting that typed in too. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I was going to put in there, Mike. You know, there is an occasion maybe in the comment portion um, when we uh, look at those that we may, you know, we may comment to what conditions are like with local access around the game damage area. Um, and just kind of a, to build on why, uh, maybe why that issue, why that issue is occurring or, you know, um, maybe some alternatives to, to speak with adjacent landowners to try to, you know, get some, some cooperative, cooperative efforts between landowners and addressing some of those issues. So, so, so sometimes it is in the comment portion, but uh, like you said, Mike, most of the time it is not something that's formally recorded every time. Yeah. Steve, so, you got your hand up. Yeah, I, I figure we still got about five minutes. If there's anybody to help refine my question and, and that of some of my hunting partners and people I bump into. I hunt, I've hunted region five my whole life. I'm an old man. Um, and bear juice and uh, snowy's belts and whatever. But I've hunted the priors a lot, especially in the last couple of decades. The efforts Fish, Wildlife, and Parks made to improve the uh, mule deer buck uh, uh, age class distribution in the priors starting 20 years ago has been pretty successful. Um, you, know, you had to get up, you didn't have to get a special tag, but if you put in and got that tag, that's the only place you could hunt mule deer bucks. Um, I've talked to people from Bridger, Belfry, Red Lodge, and whatever. They've been hunt, hunting there their whole lives, too. We've all seen a little bit of improvement there. Bottom line is, pretty much everybody knows the easiest way to kill a white tail or a mule deer buck is to wait till the rut. Well, um, with chronic wasting disease and then the changes in the uh, hunting regs in the priors to where now, you know, you don't need that, quote, special permit, and you can hunt bucks or does, um, quite a few of us are starting to wonder about, well, what would be the harm in at least cutting the season short, um, possibly help protect some of those uh, uh, older age class mule deer bucks uh, and some white tail too, by closing down the season in there um, before the rut starts. Go ahead and hunt uh, deer to try to uh, help get a lid on chronic wasting disease. But don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. If you could continue to nurture some of those big old bucks, um, that seems like a good thing. If that's a, if if that's not a, if, if there's some way I can refine that question or get some better information before we send in formal comments, um, that's the point of bringing it up tonight. Maybe it's beyond tonight, Matt and Sean. If if you don't mind, if if this is too much for tonight, maybe we could talk about that some other time. 
Well, Steve, we'd be glad to talk to you about it at any time, uh, but I will give you a short answer. Great. Um, probably the biggest driver of distribution of expansion of, of chronic wasting disease appears to be older age class bucks. So our strategy in the priors um, and in most areas uh, with our CWD management plan is to um, reduce buck doe ratios and reduce the, uh, the age class of those bucks. Uh, with chronic wasting, in the face of chronic wasting disease, it is our deliberate attempt to uh, remove a good share of those older bucks and hold the buck doe ratios at probably less than 10 bucks per hundred does. Uh, you know, when, when we were in a permit situation in the priors, our objective was 25 bucks per hundred does. So we're looking at a, a rather significant shift in management philosophy um, in the face of CWD. So that's, that's the short answer. That's a real good answer. And Sean, I really appreciate it and Matt too. Um, I'm, I, uh, I, as I said, I really appreciate and support the science. Um, I would like to visit with you in a little bit more detail and get, get uh, smartened up a little bit more about that. But thanks for that answer. And that helps as far as my uh, comments uh, under this formal process too. Yeah, oh, that's great, thanks. Very good. We're about ready to wrap up our uh, uh, promise to get out of here by nine o'clock. Uh, so CAC members, uh, you can look forward to getting uh, an email from me here in the relatively near future where we can start uh, churning away at what we're going to do next as far as uh, meetings and times and dates and topics. We've got a lot of stuff going on that can uh, use some CAC input. And so uh, you'll be hearing from us uh, relatively soon on that. Um, Anything else before we uh, depart? I would like to thank everybody and uh, particularly Bob and Robbie for uh, keeping the Zoom ship floating um, and for everybody taking the time. So definitely appreciate it. Very good. Thank you. And everybody have a safe, uh, warm evening. And if you have to drive, drive safely. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Thanks, thank everybody. you. Good night, folks. <laughs>